happy. Yes, chat will help us out. Hi guys. Good morning. <laughs> so I guess it's like late night in uh the States, right? It's like plus six hours, yeah. So Yeah. And uh in Sweden it's uh ten hours difference, so it must be midnight in Sweden right now, or in Europe, most of Europe at least. Seven PM Pacific. So oh, okay, so you guys like have the evening time in the States then. Yeah, yeah it's like evening. All right. Uh, chat, you guys going to have to help us out with the audio. Uh, it's going to be a bit scuffed. Hotel stream. Uh, we're not going to show much more of the room because it's a mess. <laughs> but uh, we have Grimroll and we have Snap Out with us. Uh, we um, have about less than two hours, so an hour and change because we're going to get ready for dinner tonight. Um, sounds good. Audio is pretty decent. Or I'll take that as a win. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to literally, it's going to be hard for us to read chat because. <laughs> Get away. Skeptic set up. It's far away, so we might not be able to read chat too much. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, we're just gonna have a conversation between us three uh, about what we experienced and few uh, too. This is sound like a really, really detailed podcast already. I well, guess well, doing. I mean, there's a lot to talk about with Pee too. Like, I mean, for sure. I mean, like we got Mega Group guy, Solo Scup dude, and Crafting King. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of like we got, we got, we got, we got, and we all played a lot. Yeah. yeah, how many did you play? Like, how many playthroughs? This is 45 minutes. Even if you were on the streamer them. setup, it was 45 minutes. So, like, how many times did you play through the... You only got 45 minutes on the streamer setup. I thought, yeah, I thought all the oh, streamers... Oh, I asshole uh, Kelly about it. I was like, oh, you I'm not keep me more time. Oh, uh, I, see. <laughs> uh, I mean, I only did it in 45 minutes as well. I think everyone got 45 minutes. That's what I thought, yeah. too. They... You got extra time, I guess. Yeah, and then for... there was a morning. They uh, allowed us, uh, I know, sub and uh, subtract them and uh, sis... Uh, I was there as well the morning before they opened, so we had uh, like no, almost two hours uh, prior as well. We didn't have that. Um, so uh, some people took it, but I guess they most didn't. Um, I had time for all of them though. So um, you played every class? Like, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So, I, I, I didn't favorite. spend too much on the warrior. Uh, my favorite was. Uh, I, yeah, I'm gonna say the hundreds because they performed the best. But I, I felt personally that the sword had like the best control. I felt like I, I actually had control over the battlefield more with the sorcerer. Uh, but the hundreds was definitely the best performer. I agree in terms of like hundreds being the most like damage. It felt kind of the best. Mm. I actually enjoyed warrior a lot specifically because of leap slam. Hmm. It felt good to like leap slam. Did it? Is? It, I mean, not not in like the context of PoE one, but like all the other uh, classes, I felt sometimes a little frustrated because like I'm getting body blocked by the mobs and like that kind of thing. Oh yeah. And so like when I had leap slam on the warrior, I was able to just like kind of like jump with leap slam, and it felt good in that regard. Yeah. But it was the only class with a uh, mobility or a mobility skill that existed in the the demo we played. Do you know if it was maze locked? I didn't check. Uh, I'm pretty sure I equipped an axe at one point and I couldn't use anything, so I just immediately... Even leap <laughs> I don't... I didn't check. I couldn't use any of the other stuff. I don't remember. I don't remember if it was just huh. maces. Because a lot of the skills are weapon locked, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. If was only hammers, it would be like, ooh, okay. Yeah, no, but from what I, I heard from a dev, this is hearsay, but I think the only reason that, uh, Warrior had Leap Slam and the other classes didn't have a mobility skill is because Warrior was in Act 4. So presumably oh. you go later on with the other classes and they get their own like mini mobility skills. Yeah, like but... a blink or something. For Some, the sword something or whatnot. Yeah, that makes sense. Not that Leap Slam is like the only mobility skill. It's like mm. this. just because Warrior was the Act Four demo class that that's the one that had the mobility skill. So... Really interesting. Yeah. I wasn't sure if they were going to add a mobility build. Or... I wasn't sure either. Yeah, I feel like they should because like going up like small gaps like fences and like you know yeah. small elevation changes it feels really bad to have to like walk around like that kind of thing so yeah i mean it's one thing we're slowing the game down and one to just make it a fucking pain <laughs> yeah i mean so that's what i enjoyed about the warriors just leaf slam is just going up gaps like that kind of thing all right do you guys find yourself getting like um body blocked or like yep yeah like... they said they like that though right did you hear them in the talk that's why the Ooh. dodge roll doesn't go through stuff because they want you to be worried about that. Which about is why... getting stuck? Yeah. 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 To me, yeah. that was the most frustrating part, was like not having phasing on specifically the dodge roll. Mm -hmm. I found it like really frustrating when I was trying to dodge past something, and I would like barely get hit by like one spider or something on the floor, and then my dodge roll would just like kind of stop, and mm -hmm. then the mobs would surround you, and yeah. you can't move, and it's just like... I think that not only is it like you get body blocked, but once you had like just one too many monsters, yeah, you couldn't cast your abilities on the castle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, like my mentality going in on the sorcerers, 
was I'm gonna gather up a bunch of one shot monsters, yeah, yeah. pop my Nova, kill them. You know, I gather a bunch of uh, you know, small monkeys. You I click Nova, nothing's happening. I'm spamming Nova, oh, nothing's yeah. happening. You it's stutter, 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 stutter. Oh, it. No, I totally feel that. Like that was that was like one of the other pain points on. I didn't like Stork because of that reason. I kept trying to get spells out and I would just get interrupted over and over again. It ended up with me like ice walling it. Yeah. And then you, cool you basically too. just had to gather them up, and no matter what you did before they surrounded you, you have to get the ice wall up. Then you can know with them from the other side of the ice nova, as uh, the ice wall. But um, projectiles don't go through the ice wall. But AOE hey, abilities do. So you can't cast out arc past the the uh, ice wall. Oh. But you could do the nova and then you know unleash with the staff, drop uh, uh, the comet. So that was kind of like the play I did for clearing. It was ice wall and nova was range. Otherwise, it was just wall and no uh, comet, wall and comet was all I did. It was kind of dull once I got into that motion, but it felt like the safest way to progress. Like, even yeah. rares, once you had the, the ice ball, you could surround the rare and just get him stuck in there and just cast comets forever. I agree. That that situation you described where, like, you just aggro some mobs and you're, like, running away from them, and then you try to turn around to cast. When you try to do that thing to turn around and, like, cast a spell, I found it especially, like, annoying when, like, you turn around to do your cast and you get stunned, like, the first time, and so you kind of, like, develop a muscle memory to like cast again because you know that the first spell you're going to cast or input is like going to get canceled or, or you know staggered or whatever so you don't it doesn't ever go through yeah so like you have to input multiple spells knowing that you're just going to get stunned out of the first one yeah with the sword i don't know you guys are using ice wall yeah both of you i i didn't actually use ice wall i just kind of it was my to go to choice I, to stay safe i had to like just not i felt like i was playing an mmo and i was just like don't <laughs> aggro too many things because if right. i aggro too many things it's like out of control and then yeah. you die that's kind of like what it felt like a little bit i was just i, I pulled everything i could and just if you just spam the ice over this can't move on sword yeah yeah but they just the, get frozen yeah i mean if you get like a little bit of a gap but there's some of the like the monkeys in the jungle they're like too fast especially they, the like, big ones yeah, the you get big, one of those yeah, at those the same big time ones, you're fucked <laughs> yeah those big ones are like on you i felt like i don't know i was i just I snow though, and then put down either a frost mine or you cast a common and just die. You didn't experience like ever trying to cast that frost nova initially because there is a cast time on that that frost nova, right? Yeah, I mean, you it's, it's a little canceled. one. Yeah, you can get you can get it canceled though. Yeah, and, like, yeah, that's enough for, sure. for you to just like die sometimes. Like you follow up with another one though, and you can freeze them, and then you yeah, and you do it again. It, yeah. yeah, but there are instances. I agree. Like if that frost nova, like I was using it to like control stuff, but there are sometimes like stuff's chasing you. You try to input the frost nova. And you get stunned, and yeah. then you just die. Were you, were you trying to use lightning skills? Uh, I don't I use dark fire spark, single targets. Spark a little bit felt okay with unleash the. Yeah, but yeah, with unleash, sure. Uh, I dropped uh, spark entirely. I only yeah. used dark for single target and comet. They just felt more stable. Um, even with unleash for single targets, I don't uh, know. Just just felt more smooth. I do agree though with the ice nova. Like yeah. in most cases, I was able to pull that off. But if it was one too many monsters, yeah. I couldn't get the Nova off. It was faster to drop the ice wall and get that little gap to create the ice wall between you and the enemies, and then yeah. you can do the Nova. But if it was too many, like it, it's enough for two, maybe three monsters too many, it was impossible to get it off. So it ended up, like you said, this like, like MMO mentality yeah. where I can't pull too much. I pulled too and, much, yeah. That, and that's I, like, sometimes what I felt. Yeah, and as soon as I got into that state, I was like, oh, now I got the hang of it. And then I realized, this is an ARPG, hello? <laughs> but at the same time, I all, we also have to keep in mind that the difficulty is ramped up for us. Yeah, yeah, of uh, course. It, it's suboptimally geared. Oh my god. Was, um, it was bad. And, you know, the, the skill set, I mean, there, there are skills that uh, I'm, I know for a fact I wouldn't use. I mean, there are several skills that are barely touched at all. Uh, such as Spark, for example. I would have another composition of skill sets uh, when I play it, when the game is, is uh, launched, basically. Um, so I mean, it was definitely um, choo -choo. definitely a um, uh, a weird feeling. Yeah. But I also feel I feel like a lot of those aspect of us looking at it more like an MMO versus an RPG suddenly is because of other factors and not that the game is actually going to be played that way. For later. sure. Yeah. I think I'm actually remembering because I did mess around with my support gems a little bit. Did you guys notice that deep freeze like kind of support gem? I felt like something about freezing. Oh, the. Uh... Oh, I got that. It, yeah. Or the Frozen Nexus. I th Ma frozen Nexus support, yes. Yeah. What, what, do you guys remember exactly what it did? No. It I didn't left a lingering for three second effect on your ability that chilled and froze enemies in the area. I, 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 I don't know. I remember messing around with my support gems a little bit, and I did put 
a freeze related one on the ice nova. So maybe that was maybe that was the difference. I don't know. No, I had it on my ice nova as well. Oh, okay. The problem was getting the cast off. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what I felt. I agree. Yeah. Like it was for me, like getting that initial cast off. Like once you get the cast off, it's fine. This stuff's frozen, but like when the stuff's chasing you, it's like when it gets cancelled, it feels extra bad. Which yeah. is kind of like actually why I like the warrior the best because I had the mobs chasing me and I could use the leap slam to get enough distance to then turn around and safely like cast whatever at the mobs that were chasing me. Mm, but because the other classes didn't have that mobility, I didn't have a, like a way to get gap from the mobs and like turn around and cast safely because a lot of the animations are long. Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I like at the start I was definitely feeling that, but after I like was on my last run, which my last run was the Huntress where I actually beat the demo. Yeah. I was like barely getting stunned. I think it's like a spacing issue and just knowing the cast times, if you know what I mean. You know like in, you know in WoW how you like you like start crit casting and stuff like that? Yeah. And you like know when to cast yeah. and when not to. I yeah, kinda exactly. feel like it might be that kind of a situation a little bit. Definitely when you get the tempo in. Like certain areas, once you've got the hang of the monsters you're facing, it was way better. You got the you, you know when you can cast what and in what order and stuff like that. I didn't really feel that the playstyle that they are they're striving towards with this whole you're supposed to maybe not use it, say the word rotation because it's too MMO esque, but um, you're supposed to use your skills in a certain order for optimized performance. Yeah, I, I didn't feel that at all in many cases, especially with the chaos damage areas uh, with the sorcerers. Uh, I ended up being like, I need to make sure those chaos protectors do not fucking hit me, and I swall fix that, and then I could just calm it, and that was so safe and comfortable to play. So I ended up my playstyle was just ice walling off the enemies and then commenting anything that was big and large packs of enemies I would ice Nova and if they ran up too close to me I had to get that uh, the ice wall off to then Nova and Comet and then for single target it was yeah you know, I'll use Nova if spawned ads and treated them as a weak clearing and then I would pop that uh, mana cost increase uh, surge thingy and uh, just arc it with unleash that's it kind of felt like I had a clear setup uh, you know playing MF builds or having a clear setup versus a single target setup instead of rather having a a composition of oh well I, i've got a pack of enemies i'm going to pop the a we the mana sur uh, cost increase uh, surge thingy then i'm going to know with them and i'm going to put yeah. a frost bomb on and then i'm going to accommodate and if they're still alive i'm going to start casting arc all of a sudden or there's bots of enemies spread i'll cast arc and like that that never occurred it was very they, streamlined i mean i played warrior twice on the oh, playthrough shit. i did i did one of each and i did warrior twice and the thing that i can point to on warrior specifically was like they had um the armor breaker you hit three times and then you'd like it's like breaking their armor and then if you hit them with sunder it had like double damage and like a guaranteed crit right. that's like uh, so i think they're like moving towards like combo skills type thing where like you debuff or do like a slight debuff or something like that and then you do like a, like a finisher like they're, they're pseudo spender like builder spender skills not quite it's not like you're building a spirit bar or something like yeah it's not on cool yeah like, mm -hmm. but there is some like things where you're like you're building up like on warrior you're building up the armor breaker and then once you break the armor you do like the big sun rent does like a lot of damage mm -hmm. and there's like a few of those that i think that they're moving towards like trying to design like combo skills kind of that i've seen hmm. i wonder if that's actually going to happen though because i mean everyone's just going to take the path of least resistance right of course yeah. so so the path of least resistance is from my perspective you need a clear skill still right whether yeah. that's multi-clear with two different skills or one different skill on the hunter so you can do it with one easily sure lightning spear ice spear too when you get it it's yeah good. yeah uh you need some way to deal the most single target damage which whether that's an armor breaker Whatever. combo yeah. or on the hunters i was just using puncture over and over again and that's that was good, too. Yeah. good enough but then the new element in poe2 is the defensive mobility slash crowd control slash whatever you want to go and do with that like on the warrior i don't know if you did this did you leap slam in and stun all the enemies and yeah. then attack that's the thing that let you like because i wanted to try and finish the warrior campaign and so i just ended up leap slamming and when you land on leap slam it stuns everything yes so mm -hmm. you can get another leap slam off before you get stunned out of the cast so yeah. you can kind of leap slam through the whole map mm -hmm. and that felt good because you can just skip all the trash because you couldn't level or anything like that in the demo. So yeah, well, you don't cool. want to kill the trash. You just go to the boss and fight it. So. But you can also leap slam and then attack without getting stunned. Yeah, of course. Definitely... And that feels good too. Just mm -hmm. like the stun on landing like felt good. You so. create a little grace time where you actually yep. have yep. The time to, or frames to react and, yeah, and you put another ability off. I think that like mm -hmm. the Huntress, the Warrior, and the Sork had tools to work with the way the game uh, the current iteration of the game had the the monk though like you said you told me earlier when we were eating that um 
people had different um, experience with it. Mm. So to go through my experience with a monk, it was really nice versus bosses. I felt like I had a very good control over the the ability of dodge rolling attacking, dodge rolling attacking, even like if I ran out of mana and then I could just use the regular attack and I had mana. I felt like I had a good control in melee combat with uh, the, even the low levels versus harder bosses with telegraphed abilities and whatnot. That felt okay. But as soon as I was clearing enemies, if there were like two packs of enemies and they had like a range unit or more in each of them, if I go up to one pack, it is almost inevitable to, to like, you're going to get hit by some projectiles. And mm -hmm. getting hit means I had to use my life flask or one of them. Now, I purchased with a gold more life flasks. And that, you know, the charges went out. And if the enemy is not a magic rare or unique, you don't get flask charges back or if you level. Is it magic? Magic doesn't give it either? Or I don't remember if it was magic. I think I'm so. I'm not positive. Yeah. I did, like, yeah. The flask charge goes yeah. away quick. Yeah, yeah. But there was no other way for me to recover in the lower levels. So as I was uh, killing this left pack and the right pack was hitting me, that's, that's a couple life flasks gone. Kill the right pack, it was fine. Because all you had to do was generate a, a power charge, and then you basically kill everything. Yep. And then you had to go to the next pack, you had to kill one guy, and you know, and call it, and then you could kill everything. And it was kind of satisfying when you had the power charges, but if you had multiple power charges, that ability would consume all of them. Yep. Not mm -hmm. just one. Yeah. And then the problem with that, since you didn't recover your flask, and any situation where enemies were positioned in a way where you're going to get hit by them, you cannot avoid it. No matter how much you're dodging, because they're staggering the attacks, they're coming, you know, not at the same time while uh, flying towards you, you're going to get hit. It was that I ran out of flask charges. And that forced me to, when I was cleared a pack, I had to port back to town, click the well to refill my flask, and then go back and continue. And that, like, it was so annoying. Going to town. Yeah. What yeah, was your guys' experience with it? I mean, personally, I I don't think it adds much to the gameplay having to go back to town. But you had that experience as well. Yeah, I, yeah. Some bosses. Um, I, well, there's one boss on where like it's very safe just to go to town and refill your flask. But I'm just asking myself, why am I doing this? That's kind of like yeah. Or why is this necessary? I guess surely there's some other way to like have the boss drop some sort of like flask you can go and pick up or something like that. But having to go to town and then click the like the altar to refill or the well to refill your flash just felt unnecessary. Yeah. Mm. But I don't know. I went in with a fresh mind because I knew it was going to be a different game. Like yeah. As soon of as course. they said split, I was yeah. like, okay, oh, it's a brand new game. Um, and honestly, when I was like getting into the groove of things, like you go up against the boss, first thing I do is put a portal down. Yeah, of course. Like I don't, I don't even hit the boss before I put a portal down because I know I'm gonna run out of flasks. And then you go back to town and yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, you, you start out with full flasks, yeah. yeah. Of course. And then you like, I like use all my mana, and then I go back, and then come back in, put down another portal, because I know I, I then I have an option to go out and get more flasks again. So that's kind of what I did, and I didn't really feel like it was a problem going to the well. I don't know. I, I didn't really care. I was just like, okay, I'm going to get my, my shit back. I'm going to get back in there and kill that shit. I don't know. Yeah, it was like slower than PoE 1 boss, but the whole entire thing was slower than PoE 1. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, like, I'd rather have a, a longer fight where I have to dodge the abilities and feel like I'm engaging with the fight. But you did have to do that. You did, yeah, you did exactly. Have but I'd rather have that than what we have in PoE 1. Like, take Hillock as a prime example. Everyone's fucked Hillock. You, you don't you don't do anything. You go up, you face tank, you hold down right click. Oh, you took a hit, click life flask. Oh, you take another hit, click life flask. The guy's dead before you run out of last charges. You're done. Yeah. And that you could not do that in the PoE two with the I monk, right? You could with the warrior a bit. You could. Yeah, a little bit. I'd, with the I'd rather have like a cast time on chugging a life flask than to have a cast time on the portal that makes me go and refill the life flask because like if you think mm -hmm. of like soulsborne games or any of these games that have similar kind of mechanics like they always when you're healing it's always like a long like chugging and like you're yeah. vulnerable during that window yeah and uh, it's like similar in poe like these boss fights are like you're dodging and like doing this kind of thing i feel like if they just had like some sort of cast time or whatever on healing or on the flat life flask itself you wouldn't need to have such hard penalties on like refilling your flask or... yeah no, i like the, the fact that like taking bosses aside because I, I felt like that could be kind of fine uh sorcerers actually had a really good experience with with the boss because of like the dodge mechanic and the control of the fight felt very smooth and you don't need to use your flask if you do that properly that that's how i felt and when you get the hang of things at least with some fights not all of them um, but like I think the problem is when you start clearing the areas, you you want to level up. Well, for us, we in the demo we don't have to, but in our case, uh, when you're leveling up, 
you have to kill the monsters, right? And anytime you engage in a fight and it's not a monster that will recharge your flasks, you eventually just run out of them. And when you run out of them, you have to go back. It's not like, sure, clear speed, meta, power creeping, and all that, uh, that's one thing. But forcing a, a player in their initial experience to kill a handful of packs of monsters, then they gotta go back to town to refill the flask, feel, it felt so bad. But you said there were people who didn't have that experience. I don't know how they did it. Um, on the on the on the ranger, what was what, Huntress? Huntress. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I I believe there was some form of flask regeneration. People were saying they were watching Crypt stream, and they saw the health flasks go back up on some way, some shape or form. So, um, there probably is some sort of mechanic in place on the ranger side of the tree. I would have to imagine. Mm. Like if you think about the PB one tree, there is stuff which grants life blast charges. Life, so. Yeah, I don't exactly know if that was active in it, but people were saying there was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I, I mean I I was porting back to town when I was playing the sorcerer, and yeah, I mean I don't know, and maybe maybe it's I can't imagine doing that ever in map, but we'll have tools to deal with that by the time we're in map. Sure, yeah, I have no idea what they're adding later. Yeah. It's going right. to be more refined, like you mentioned, we, we talked about before, like, everyone's going to be able to have their own little mobility skill, you're going to have actually fleshed out build you're playing, and all of those things, so if there is a problem, when you're in maps, there's already a solution plan for that, right? Yeah. So that's, I don't think that's a problem, but the progression early on, because as soon as you went from the Monk's early act to playing the Huntress, for example, it was night and day, suddenly the, well, obviously the class felt a lot stronger to begin with, the toolkit that had available to it. But it just felt so much better and you went from that one into the sork i felt like i had more control over the way i was playing obviously since it, it is a lot of cc here gets spells right yeah so the, providing that control uh and then you go from from that approach to uh to the warrior that also had a level of control where you could leap slam and they're stunned and then you have that grace time where you can now either leap slam again or do an attack because the enemies are not going to stagger you because they're stuck yeah all right well, Monk, I don't know if it's just really poor optimized uh, yeah, skill yeah. choices for it, or if it's over right? Yeah, but I do de definitely think that life flasks need to, or flasks in general, need to have, similar to maybe, um, I talked to uh, uh, James about that. Um, the idea was to use fla life flask charges or flask charges to be similar to how uh, souls work on unique targets for vault skills, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, increments of damage would spill out X amount of souls, but in this case, anyone in the area would get X amount of last charges per X percent kill uh, damage to the boss. D4, for example, has that system where if, when you, you have increments, when you reach this much damage to the boss, it will spawn health globes, so you can recover some charges in your blast, for example. So similar to that, but, you know, a little bit nicer than, than the... Uh, stupidity of d4 i guess yeah i mean i know what you're saying but i mean for me at least you know when d4 came out and the beta was out and everyone was like making these quick <laughs> statements um about like how it's gonna play out in endgame and stuff like that and then yeah, it ended up just being completely different yeah i'm trying not to glean too much about like the end game like i don't even think they know how the end game is even gonna look at this yeah. point because we're a year out that's yeah all that stuff comes later so i don't even i mean there was a kernel of truth and what people were saying about D4. Sure. Um, but, yeah, do you, do you actually realize... Because we spent, what, like, seven hours a league? Something like that. In the story tops? Yeah. And then, like, the next 200 or an end game or 300 or whatever, how much you guys play? Um, so, do you foresee the flask system actually being problematic in end game when you consider stuff like having access to clarity, vitality, flask charge, regen, or even just life regen or mana regen? It depends on how they handle Leech. I feel like if they want to keep the bosses in this sort of fashion where you have to like really dodge and like do all of this kind of thing, like they're going to have to not have Leech be a really big thing in PoE 2. It, you it, stand it, there and... it invalidates so many mechanics, yeah. which is true. And Leech does. If you get a, a certain amount of Leech and it recovers fast enough, you just ignore everything. And that's just how it is. So they're going to have to like put the clamp down on Leech to not have it like flask and stuff. <laughs> completely irrelevant and there's lots of modifiers to flask because i i had a couple of modifiers on the flask when i would play here uh, on the actual flask themselves oh, yeah here. so Rolling. there was um shit there was uh one that gave me power charge and kill for example Excuse me? really yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. i think it was called medic 
No, it was maybe another one. Uh, but it, it did give power charge on kill uh, as a modifier on my flask. I don't say balance with a uh, bug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, but obviously, this was during the flask's uh, active time, obviously. If it was um, a mana flask, though, couldn't you mess with that? Theoretically, sure. Um, and I mean, uh, blood magic support, um, you know, get that on the life flask, having a yeah. small life flask, keep it ticking all the time. I mean, there, there certainly are the things you can do uh, play around with it. But these are, again, uh, toolkits that we have available to us for the late game, where you can yeah. deterministically try to get for craft or make sure you get that flask with that modifier. That's not something you have in the early stage, which I feel was the biggest problem for the monk, in my experience at least. Uh, whereas the the you know literally the other classes just became better and better and better in terms of um, uh, how smooth they were to play. Yeah, I agree. I mean, okay, so I think we pretty much established the flask is probably not going to be a big issue in the end game. Yeah, what, what do you think about the uh, the utility flask? Like, how are they handling the utility flask? Like, removing quicksilver and they're kind of having like. Well, as the dev, and we also heard the talk. Yeah. There's going to be a mitigation flask, which sure. is the replacement to a guard. There's also going to be ailment removal, which that's pretty much telling like it's going to be it. Reactive ailment immu- or removal, yeah. right? So you have to be burning first before you trigger a burning immune flask. So you have to yeah. like, react to something. Yeah, they, they, uh, they have been pushing for uh, a lot of reactional gameplay consistently. And that doesn't work when you have skeletons one-shotting you from two screens away. But in PvE 2, you can have reactional approaches to it. So utility flask, with the purpose of being a reactive toolkit for mm-hmm. you, makes sense. And it also makes you feel like, it, I don't want to use the word immersion, but it makes you feel like you're actually actively making a skillful choice or reaction to the thing, the environment in the game. Whereas in PvE 1 right now, I mean, I don't even play the piano. We all put in transgressors, auto casting the enchant yeah. on it, unless we're using mage blood. So it's poor mass mage blood and mage blood. That's how most people play it. It's it's, it's just proactive gameplay consistently. Zoom, 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 and that's I don't know, you guys love that. But <laughs> I'm just saying, like they can't have a reactive approach to those things in PV one because of how the game is. Whereas it definitely feels like they have hit a kind of good spot with it, they just need to fine tune and uh, tweak these numbers now with like charges, for example, in the early stage. But it definitely felt to me that the the reactive approach to the game with these choices, as uh, same thing with the dodge mechanic for that matter, made me feel like I'm not just running around, just one-shotting everything uh, from the start of the game. It was more like, I see an ability, I have to make a conscious decision. Can I take the hit to pop a life flask or maybe a defensive like to mitigate it yeah. exactly uh, or do i try to dodge it with a dodge roll and i mean uh, i don't know that just felt like it uh, created a more immersive gameplay experience yeah i think all right so we all know how this is all going to go uh, and that's i really i'm very curious what you guys have to say I talked to you a little bit already gazzy but they have these big ideas about how they want the game to be played yeah but the game is like so open and there's so much in it. What, six classes, 36 ascendancies, 1,000 something skill points, uh, you know, crafting, gear slots, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and then in the case of Snap, six times that with his six party members and all the synergies that he's going to have. Um, there's absolutely no chance they're going to achieve their design goals in that environment. It's not going to be balanced. There's no way. There's no possible way to balance that. But that's fine if it's uh, like balancing for the upper end is sometimes like not always the goal, right? That's right. But when they put a system in like um, the guard flask, right? Sure. The, as soon as that would be in the game, if I had the control to do so, I would just use four of those. And on the warrior, I would just always have one on and just sit in melee, face tanking everything with the guard skill on and a life flask and just kill it. I mean, yeah, a lot of the bosses' attacks are super telegraphed. Like, they did a really good job, I think, on the bosses. Like, there's a big indicator. The boss is doing a big swing, and it's, like, super telegraphed. Um, I mean, in that regard, like, you could definitely, like, just sit there with guard flash or whatever and just tank one attack and then tank another attack and then tank a third attack and then go back to town and refill them. And and then then do it again. Just completely ignore all the design stuff they put in. Like, I mean, that's just the way it's going to go, right? Historically, that would be yeah. how it goes. But... Yeah. 
I do want to say though, when it comes to the telegraphed approach to the game, we've seen how people you know, have Final Fantasy XIV, well, Final Fantasy Online is telegraphed and abilities, similar to how Diablo Four is telegraphed and abilities. They show exactly the the area of this is the attack is coming. It's going to hit in this area. I hate being handheld to that level. The way they telegraphed in Theory Two was this guy is charging up his axe. You know, you can expect it to do some sort of bigger range hit that's going to yeah. come, but we don't know exactly where you're safe, so that's something you have to feel, but you know it's coming. So I felt like it was much more engaging to see that I'm going to have to get out of here, and so before you learn the fights and see it as a new player to the experience in that content, you know, you were three times further away than you needed to because you know you could you cannot waste that life blast. You wanted to get out of that because you saw it coming, right? That it was well telegraphed. So I like that rather than these... Yeah. indication indicator showing it's gonna do this big of a radius yeah yeah yeah. i mean i did enjoy like learning the patterns of the bosses that's something that's definitely like a step up from pue one to pue two um that's it's not yeah it's not as you say it's just like a big indicator and it's like step out of the red zone and then you yeah. that's, yeah, it's that's definitely exactly. not like that there's definitely like yeah. some patterns you have to learn and like that kind of thing uh for the bosses for sure but the um the thing about the like the bosses is um i feel like when i was fighting the bosses it was a uh... i could definitely just like ignore a ton of the mechanics that they were doing at least on warrior it, i don't know you if were tanky enough yeah. you were definitely tanky enough mm -hmm. yeah but i don't know if anybody else has that luxury or if that's just the, I mean, the warrior was also in a later act more fleshed out in terms of gearing passive tree which we have no idea for those of you who don't know when we were playing we had no control over the passive tree it was hidden we were unable to touch it if we leveled up we couldn't use the points and we had like a preset uh, tree essentially and uh, we had a preset uh, of gear as well and you didn't really start with much to work with uh, outside of what we dropped, and I uh, mean, some, some of the time, some of the playthroughs, I did get a few upgrades just from drops. That was kind of fun. Uh, outside of that, it's just a gold, so you can actually gamble for items uh, in the vendor uh, for items that were really bad. That, that's basically the the outline of things we had. And like you said, it definitely felt like the uh, basically every act, uh, every different character was only played through certain acts. So monk was the first one, then hunters, and sorcerers, and warrior. And for each step up, I felt like the character was more refined. Obviously, the kit was more fleshed out for that we had available to us, but also the gearing and the stats felt like it was just smoother to play with. So I definitely agree that the warrior was, without doubt, the most fleshed out and well-rounded. I don't want to say well the beast that said that earlier. <laughs> but well-rounded, right? Yeah. So I think that's because of that, but it could also have a lot to do with... Um, uh, the, the kit that they provided us just was on point for the warrior compared to the other classes maybe yeah i also i want to mention something about like the indicators you were talking about earlier like the dodge roll right it only dodges certain things like it only dodges projectiles and melee swings but not aoe attacks yeah, right not AOE. correct and i think in some of the character has to be outside yeah. of the aoe and some of the boss fights where you're mentioning like the boss is like doing a swing it's sometimes unclear whether or not He's doing an AOE or a melee attack, and so you don't know if you can dodge roll out of it until you, you... can roll behind him though. It's like yeah, yeah. Of, yeah you mm -hmm. can of course like dodge out of the way, but sometimes it's like unclear if you can dodge roll an attack if it's an AOE attack or a melee attack. Yeah, because you can kind of it's not iframes, but it is you can avoid like melee swings with the dodge roll. Yeah. But sometimes it's an AOE attack, and so it's like sometimes a gamble if it's this is going to be an AOE swing or a melee swing, and that sometimes is getting you killed. So. It just takes some learning, I guess. Yeah, and just, I mean, we're going to play through the X a handful of times and then we're going to know those things, right? Especially now that uh, something that I very much liked was that the, there would be uh, permanent bonuses to your character for killing the side bosses. So you're now in a position where you are incentivized to engage with the entirety of the game. I like that because I feel like PoE 1, the. the obviously we don't like running through the campaign too much, which is always going to happen, PoE 2 inevitably as well. Uh, you know, sometime later. Uh, but I'm not like there's so certain areas that I haven't touched in God knows how many years mm. because it's a complete waste. Why would I go to Fetid Pools? I mean, if I play Ruthless or Soul Self, I might go there for savings and regrets, but I would never go there unless there's a challenge forcing me in there, right? I mean, I mean, we we're gonna save that for what it is. Yeah, it's a design incentive, right? 
it's it's like the altars of Lilith in sure. D4. Yeah. Like, there's not one. there's yeah there's not a world in which you won't get all the bonuses. So it's just mm. more things on your checklist, right? Yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. So it's it's yeah a way they've gotten to make you do the content. But it also makes it so if, if we translate that to how a newer player or a new player would experience the game when they're incentivized to explore everything and do that, they don't miss out on those things. It also means that they'll be not playing the zoomy play style where we are going to try to make sure we are just a few levels under the area we're fighting in to optimize our performance for speed. Now, now we're going to be in a position where if you engage with all of these side contents and whatnot, you'll actually have the levels to match the content we're about to engage with plus that extra bonus. Because I remember, I think it was a sorcerer had one of the side bosses, the snake, in the yeah. snake pit that was because the chaos was rough and that there was like this item that gave you passive just 10 percent chaos rest and yeah. that helped a lot because my first time i didn't go through that snake pit i kept going and i was getting what but that that extra 10 percent helped mitigate quite a few rips that would have happened without it i mean it's gonna be great for new players and people just exploring the game the first time oh yeah um, for existing players though, and for like someone like Snap, I can already see him with his six man party setting the portals well, up, porting everyone around, getting all the bonuses. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. The, even Diablo like pulled back on the renown grind. I, I could see it Slightly, being yeah. definitely a chore. Like, I mean, not the first time, but you know, the second, third, fourth time, if you have to go and kill a hundred bosses to get your permanent stab bonuses, like that can get exhausting really quickly. Oh shit! It's actually gonna be a hundred, isn't it? That's what they said. It's a hundred bosses. But what about? I wonder if all of them are gonna have. I mean, they're gonna have something. Probably fire res or like cold sure. res attack speed maybe or whatever bonus they give, right? And we don't know if it's all of them, but yeah, if it is all of them, oof, that is a lot of bosses. It's I mean, definitely going to create, like you said, like a checklist. So the question then would be, do you only have to do it once? For no, they said count? per character. Jonathan yeah. said that. Yeah. He did say that. It's not even per league, it's per character. Yeah, per character. So okay. imagine you reroll on Diablo 4 or whatever, and you have to go and click all the... All oh, all man, that is actually quite some some uh, commitment there. What is it? A boss is probably like two to five minutes, and they think on, the yeah. act bosses were way harder. I mean... Yeah, yeah so what's that? Let's just say three minutes on average. So what? A hundred bosses, 300, 300 minutes. That's a lot of time killing bosses for and not. That's just the actual that's fight. The... That's not moving up to the finding the areas. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that there. Obviously, when we talk about PvE two, we can only talk about what we've experienced and what we've heard so far. We're gonna get the beta in about a year from now. Next year. So I mean, there's definitely room to provide feedback and criticism. And I'm not a big fan of uh, checklists myself. I don't mind. And being incentivized to go into areas but if it's per character then then i'm starting to feel annoyed with it but um say that they would allow us to do it well, not not like they did with diablo 4 where you if you explore, explore the entire map on your account on whatever season that would be on your account forever um so i don't, I don't think that would be the play because uh, that means people would then leave start their next league with all of these bonus stats from all of these bosses right and that kind of feels so so but um maybe do it so that you only have to do it once per league, but that still creates a check checklist that you got to do on league launch. Similar to the Atlas, when you start pumping through that, you're going to clear every single map because it, you have to, even if there's, even if you have to go into that goddamn cells map with the dead ends to everywhere, you know, you still got to do it. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's always checklist uh, lists in, in these type of games you have to do, but there's a difference between, you know, a checklist and a checklist. Yeah, I mean, the amount of time definitely matters. I feel like, I don't know, and, and it does feel good to get the bonuses, like the Atlas bonuses, when you're doing the Atlas. Yeah. To me, that doesn't feel like a chore at all. Maybe it'll feel the same way. Maybe, I mean, if I'm getting attack speed or... I mean, you're doing, when, when it comes to the map, then you're in a position where you are in your hideouts, you go into the map, you finish it, and then you come out, and like, right, we're going to do this map now, you're not going out of your way trying to find something to do that one thing out of the way which is completely irrelevant to what you're doing you can progress by having effective leveling or effective currency grinding whatever you're doing at the same time as you're collecting these bonuses so they just become a uh, you have a destination you want to go to but to get there you're not taking a straight line doing yeah. two or three maps only you'll you'll take the, the road like this to get yeah. there and it's not like you're deviating, whereas the destination up here in your straight, your straight road will be like, instead of moving towards it as you're doing these deviations for the other maps, you go straight sideways. There's yeah. no progression until you've done that, then you come back and move up, and then you do it again before you go back and go up. 
I think that's the problem with uh, with it. I mean, if they handle it that way, like you're clearing the bosses, and that's also like progressing to like something that you're doing anyways, like that'd probably feel good. But if it's just like some side thing that you have to go and do for like a checklist, that's well, gonna feel bad. We have one as well. Like take lurker from below is is another type of checklist. Yeah. You're gonna do it because it provides skill points, right? But it's not a yeah. hundred bosses. There's ten, there's ten or twelve or something. Look at also yeah. look at also like a thirty second fight if yeah. that. Yeah. So, same with Aberrath, he's pretty quick. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but they are definitely uh, uh, deviating side paths that you have to do because they're worth it, right? The bonus is definitely something you don't want to miss out on. Um, but again, I, th I think that the, like I said before, that's a small checklist versus this massive checklist because if it's 100 bosses, like you said, even if it's, say, three minutes uh, on the low end per boss, you still have to go to each of these areas. That's a lot of time wasted. I mean, I mean, it's a video game, so that's, that's, yeah. you're, you're meant to be playing the video yeah, game. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, it's like I, I'm not, I'm not against it. I guess I have to try it to see. But at the same time, I'm thinking uh, about these, this, these configurations they gave us, right? So I don't know if you guys like actually looked quite detailedly at the skills, but some of them are. I was talking about to this about Tuna actually, and out of the skills that I saw in the demo. The mechanically powerful ones, which I would actually consider using in PoE 1, were pretty much limited to Spark, Arc, maybe the Ice Snowball, and the Huntress's Lightning Spear. Those are the only four which I would like be like, yeah, I'd use those in PoE 1. And mm -hmm. they're not locked to those characters. Like, you can use them on anything, yeah. You can use them on anything. So just like you wouldn't use Heavy Strike in PoE 1 or Glacial Hammer, you know, you, you'll you use the strongest one, right? Mm. whatever that may be or the strongest combo or however you want to go about it and in addition to that we only got the auras they gave us and when you play pee one one of the biggest power spikes you can get is an aura, putting yeah. on your heralds or something like that so like i was thinking like okay herald of thunder is like insane on the huntress like it's absolutely crazy what it does i agree and then when you would if you put that on the sork wouldn't your spark just pretty much one shot everything um yeah no it didn't You're right, yeah. yeah so it's like I mean, I can't. I, I can see a world in which, like, you know, it's probably just going to be completely like PoE 1. Because you couldn't craft any of the gems in the demo, right? It was. So you would have to drop an uncut gem. Yeah. I, never, I, I didn't get I played one. a lot, but I never yeah. got one. Yeah. So. But you will, in theory, be able to get that. Yeah, pretty and, early, yeah. and then just click whatever herald you want, and then you have it, and you have yeah. that skill, and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we'll also have way better gear, right? Like, this is also another thing about PoE 2, right? So we have no idea what passive tree they gave us. Uh, but utility flasks are gone, so borrowed power is gone there. Yeah, for sure. Um, and the support gems are also been changed, different. I have reservations about the support gems because I feel like there's a problem they might run into in the support gems because they removed all the damage off the support gems, right? Mm -hmm. Not in, not all of it. In, well, that's, yeah. that's that's the problem I'll point to is in PoE one, right? They kind of have some sort of standardization to all the gems. They say, okay, well, let's give twenty ish percent more damage to each support gem. Maybe a little more if it has some specific condition or it's like some sort of if it's just pure damage. Maybe it's a little higher, and then maybe a little bit less if it's like offering more utility. And that's kind of like what they've been balancing a lot of the support gems around. It's like twenty percent more damage or in that ballpark, right? But in PoE 2, they just removed all of the more multipliers off of support gems, right? They're just gone completely. Mm -hmm. But there are still support gems that give you damage. Yes. And I fear that you might, like, the support gems that you're equipping might just turn into the ones that are giving you damage. For example, like, uh, there's Ruthless in, uh, you know, the, the three hit thing. You get, like, a big third hit. That's Yeah, the stunning one. The, the stunning one, yeah. support, yeah. There's that one, and it gives yeah. you a big... I mean, it's a DPS increase, right? Because the third hit is more damage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there was Shockwave, I think, was one of them on Warrior. And that one is, like, 20% more AoE damage, or, or something like that along those lines. And so, like, those are damage increases. And I fear mm -hmm. that you might just end up equipping all of the support gems that give you just damage increases. And that might that might lead to less diversity than the current ones because you're pigeonholed into just the ones that give you damage only. Yes, but we don't Instead really of... have any type of diversification when it comes to support gems in PoE one that much either. It's because of the path of least resistance, yeah. Exactly. So I mean, obviously you have the you know melee go melee splash versus multi strike and is the normal normalized yeah. if you generalize the melee approach for clear versus single target. The same thing with minions like melee minions. Well, I use splash for clearing, and then when I get to a boss, I'll just swap that for multi strike red gems. It's fine. And um, uh, um, projectile base, you have like the GMP and stuff like that. But if it's a boss, you change that to another green socket, for example. Um, but um, 
it's the same thing there when you have very interesting support gems so for example uh, the uh i don't know the name of the, the charging thingy for minion support gem they talked about that was going to give them fucking adrenaline and shit oh, like that know. when they were recently summoned that's in poe1 i thought yes yeah, yeah, you one. get like crit multi when they're recently summoned yeah, exactly oh, they get adrenaline yeah. and shit like yeah, that yeah. as well insanely on insane on in theoretic uh, theoretically it's insane for like poisonous rights because it massive aps boost yeah but um it will only be used if PUB tells me it's going to give him higher DPS than <laughs> the other options, right? Yeah. And if it doesn't, I will never use it. Yeah, There's but that, no point, right? that was my problem with some of the support gems in PUB too, is that there are ones that give you damage. Yeah. Like, theoretically, there's one that gives you increased cast speed, or, or if they add faster attacks, or faster casting. Like, those are increases in damage, and, like, those will be ending up the support gems that you're equipping instead of just chance to shock or whatever like that kind of thing. i mean even so, chance to shock is a damage it, it, yeah exactly or, or yeah. yeah some of those other utility things you might think you're equipping because they're trying to make it more diverse by removing the damage penalties but yet there are still gems that have damage increases and so those are the ones that you just end up equipping it feels like i mean it always ends up being like is the baseline ability inherently good enough without alter alterations right like do you have a uh, power siphon for example in pv1 yeah. you don't need gmp on that to clear i mean no, it's no. like you're good you're like it's gonna shoot a ton of projectiles yeah. as an example right yeah. um and so that's not a modification that you would need for that to be ineffective in what it's supposed to be doing so to say yeah. um so no matter if it has damage or not i think that we're always going to find ourselves having this is the best damage support gem so you're going to use to get the best out of that or that ability depending on which one it is some abilities will need an alter like a modify a modifying your support gems and some will not need it uh depending on what type of toolkit we want to use it for right yeah. clearing single target buffing utility whatever yeah um but I, I don't think we'll ever see in poe a situation where people are going to play uh, x ability and then people are going to run that with different support gems for different approaches because we're always going to have this meta oh this is the best setup for damage of it so people will run that no matter yep. how many support gems they add they're going to run that yep so i don't sure how they can well create that it's, I mean, it's, it's not even just support gems right so did you guys you guys all played spark right i, yeah, yeah, I tried it but i was using spark yeah it, it felt good with unleash personally but yeah, it was but you, that, you used yeah. it right yeah it covers the whole screen, it's right? It's really good. With Unleash, it just like it goes everywhere. Yeah, yeah and it hits it hits all the enemies. Yep. Uh, it can still pierce and it can still fork. It can it can shotgun right if it's like against the wall. It can... Yeah, it's the old spa. So yeah. when the devs are like up there and they're like, "All right, guys, you're gonna be using combos like this bug yeah. thing." It's like, so if Spark is in the game, which it is, and if it does damage, which it does, granted we didn't have a build around it, we couldn't optimize it, we had no support chips or anything like that. Mm. How can you create a scenario in which we don't all just play Spark? You can't. So how does the design philosophy around these combo skills even work? I mean, for you and me, we go to the path of least resistance, but that's not necessarily what everybody does. That's not... Yeah, I mean, I mean, PoE is definitely a very min max game, right? Like, and a lot of people follow build guides, and the build yeah. guides will always promote the best available path of least resistance. To a degree, but there's no consensus on like what is the best. What like if I ask you what is the best build in Poe, like there's not a great answer. It really but depends there is on the top builds, though, right? There's sure. like lightning yeah. arrow, venom guy, or you know yeah. all that stuff. Like yeah, but there, there is there is like there is like like not not many people are playing heavy strike, right? No, there's not. <laughs> no, right? People gravitate towards the stuff that is yeah, considered of strong. Course. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to be getting their shit pounded in like. No. Yeah. I, no I, I don't know. I kind of. <laughs> I kind of just feel like they're not. They're not achieving their design goals by putting Spark in the game when it's like that. Hmm. That's no, true. I definitely agree with that as well. But like I mentioned before, like the playstyle uh, toolkit and the gearing that we had access to, my my feeling was Ice Wall, Comet on the Sorcerers, and there was no reason for me to use anything else whatsoever during clearing yeah. uh, outside of an ice though if they were close enough then i would do that and small it, packs that if, was it if you had uh 100 lightning the cold and herald of ice on your spark it would do what the ice nova did yeah, exactly. anyway and it has way better clear yeah no then i would literally be back in poe one zoom play style i mean yeah. i think that's what people are people are watching now and people are watching the watch the keynote presentation and the reddit was on wildfire last i checked it was last <laughs> Two days ago, last night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was the controversial topic of PV1, PV2 split. Uh, we can talk about that as well. But um, 
No, the people were calling it uh, PV2 is ruthless. And now when we're talking about it, it's like it, we just didn't have the, the, tools. the toolkit yeah. that we would have played as ARPG veterans or PV veterans at least going into the game because if we had those tools to, available, we would use one ability and mobility and then maybe have an ice snow as a backup or worst case an ice wall. But on the sorcerers in this specific example, I think it seems like most of us played a lot of the sorcerers, at least I did. Um, that would be the play. And that is right up the alley of how we play PUA1. And it yeah. would be fast. Like, it would actually be fast and yeah. effective. I, and, like, we were on one links. Literally one links. Yeah. I had a three link. Okay. Oh, what? Oh, well, okay. oh, actually, we did have a two link with the frozen nexus on our ice novas. But okay. that's not our main source of damage, does it? Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. But I think overall, like, people thinking. I, I, okay, movement speed is one thing. I don't think we'll be as fast movement speed. Of wise. course, I, I think it's a given. Yeah. Yeah, but mechanical ability to clear the map, I think it's going to be equal or better because of all the triggers. That's true. I, I feel like there's a big push from the devs to have PoE two be like a more bossing focused game, because they they talked about that in some I forget which keynote, but they were talking about they want the high tier currencies to drop from bosses i like they specifically that mentioned that yeah and yeah. so maybe we'll see less of a clear monster in the map game and more of a we're gonna go just kill the boss over and over like that's i mean that's antithetical to lead mechanics but fair enough but no they said that specifically they said the high that you yeah. have the best chance of getting high tier currencies from killing bosses they, they stated that yeah, yeah but like if you're like like a high tier currency is like one thing, right? But like, if sure. you want anything from the league mechanics, assuming they even exist, right? Like essences, legion stuff, or anything like that. Sure. That comes from in the map, right? I, I mean, we don't have any clue how they're going to implement league mechanics. Fair enough. I don't, even think, I don't even think they talked about how they're. They said they're going to do case by case and bring them over. And if there's like irreconcilable differences that they can't solve from PoE one to PoE two, it's just it's assume they're going to drop it. Yeah, I mean that's entirely. fair. Yeah. I mean there is some that are pretty much guaranteed to be in because they're in the story, like Expedition, yeah. Delirium, Heist, Allah. There's a bunch of heist characters walking heist, around in, yeah. in the town. There's like yeah, Rog yeah. and everything walking mm, around. Yeah. So I'm assuming all those mechanics are coming over in some form. I would, again, I mean, yeah. we're we're talking about like uh, some or expectations, assumptions, and uh, speculations. Uh, another thing we got to keep in mind in chat as well, for that matter, uh, is that when we're talking about specific stuff, it's a year before we even get access to the beta. Yeah, I mean, everything that we have seen can be it, it's yeah. all subject to change, right? Yeah. So we don't know, but we what what I, what I would like to see or hear more is uh, I don't want to use the word, but it's coming. Um, we need to have. I want to see the painting of the vision that they have, so we see the end game goal, what they're trying to achieve, so that we can understand the changes or the the iterations that we're watching uh, as they progress their way to that painting. Yeah, that's what I want to see. There's a lot of stuff to talk about in regards to like their stated philosophy. Like they talked a lot in a lot of the keynotes, like what their goals are for these kind of things. And I think that's the more interesting thing to talk about for sure. Mm. I think one of them they brought up that I think I want to hear your guys' thoughts on that. They were. One of the keynotes, one of the questions in the Q and A, they brought up a uh, like regret costs or like regret in the bosses, and they said they kind of want to like keep it how it is in PoE one. Like really? they want to have it so like you have a a couple side quests here and there, and you get like maybe I don't know ten to twelve regret points or whatever. Yeah. Like similar to PoE one, and I personally thought that that was like a little bit problematic because you know PoE two is like the thing that pulls in like a really broad player base to come and like jump into PoE, and I felt like coming off of D4, that regret costs in PoE are just astronomically high. And I thought it was actually really funny, you know, playing D4 and seeing, like, in, in D4, their regret cost or respect cost is near zero. It's basically free. And then well, at the same... with level, though, sure. 100, it, it starts to but ramp like, up. <laughs> yeah, but basically, like, until you're, like, in the 90s, whatever, like, the regret cost yeah. is it's almost zero, mm. really. And then watching the Diablo 4 community complain about the really high, high regret costs or respect costs was really funny because, like, in PoE, it's just, like, a different universe. Like, yeah. it's so high. Oh, for sure. And their philosophy, they talked about it, was, like, you know, they, they want to have it be, like, a really heavy cost. But I feel like maybe that's one of the things that, for newer players, can be a big friction point. Like, uh, coming into... PoE 2 definitely feels a lot more new player friendly, though, from what I played. Yeah? Well, I mean, there's not a whole lot to have to worry about necessarily it's uh what is it like pick a class pick a weapon get your skills roll out pick up some items gamble if you want that's it i mean there's the passive tree there's still a lot of the complexities of poe1 
that still uh, I mean, PP1 leveling is, like, kind of brutal. Like, with the vendor well, recipes and all sorts of stuff like that. What differentiates PoE 1 from PoE 2? Like, what, what are the main differences you see in, like, leveling between the two? Sockets. Sockets was the, the one. big one yeah. for me. Obtaining, like, like four yeah, sockets. Yeah, like, you get an five. upgrade of an item. You could just look at the item, and what are you wearing? Cool. This is better. I'll just equip it. Great and that, I, that yeah. was so smooth. <laughs> and I not have to worry about, oh, is it, or, or, is it blue, blue, green? Can yeah. I use this? Because I need to socket that for my, for my spark. Or I got to have Pierce on there. Uh, no, no, I can't use it. I don't have chromatics. Yeah. No, because we're broke. Because we're starting in that one. Oh. I mean, it's like the the fact that you could find an upgrade and actually use it, or buy an upgrade from the vendors, or gamble an upgrade from the vendors. Yeah. It wasn't a um, stress or uh, the complexity and the, the the approach of me thinking about several other steps with the item. All I had to look at is yeah. this equipment better for my character or not? Yes or no? Yes, I equip it, right? And then uh, I think that step alone is great for new players. But like you said, it still has a lot of the complexities from PoE 1 with the passive tree. The problem for us when we're talking about this um, is obviously that we couldn't see the passive tree. We didn't have yeah. no access to it. So it's hard for us to pinpoint if the passive tree was easier to manage or not. Is that it's bigger? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they said it was bigger, right? So um, it's it's really hard to, uh, to say if it's good or not. But we, from what I've been hearing, I would assume, again, speculations that that's going to maintain that level of advanced approach to the game which we all love right but that doesn't mean that making the game more casual friendly or uh, making it more beginner friendly which i think is good for the game's longevity of course um, yeah. that is being managed in a way without it being detrimental for the veterans so the main thing that reduces friction is like disjointing sockets from gear yeah is that the main mm, thing i mean i think so for me, at least, I think, so, just to kind of, like, <laughs> recap, like, where does the player's power come from in PoE 2? So, it's been taken away from flasks, it's been taken away from support gems, and it's been pretty much rolled exclusively into gear, the base gem, skill gem, and the passive tree. Those are the three things that you worry about, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. The gear is pretty easy to get. You pick it up or you gamble it. Uh, you don't really have to craft it anymore. You don't transmute it really. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. Right? You feel I like that with the gamble it's, as well. It's simplified a lot. Like, mm. with alts, there's no there's scours. There's no, there's no, like, no all jewelers, no fusings. I mean, like, there are, but, you know, you don't yeah. have to use them because there's a much less emphasis on the support gems, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the passive tree, I mean, most people are just going to look one up on online or in a sure. video. Or they're just going to explore, but, you know, that you know their prerogative. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Uh, yeah, the last one is just picking your active skill gem, but, you know, they're probably going to be just balanced around, you know, how they are. So there's only really three things to worry about from my perspective compared to what feels like a lot in PvE 1. Last, I mean, I think I agree with you, Gezi, is that the, the disjoining of the skill gems is, like, the main thing, because it's hard to determine an upgrade, because it's like, I have a four link with these stats, or, like, a three link with these stats, and then you're losing so much damage from the link. Like, that can mm. be a really tough choice. Yeah, the difference between having links and not having links and having the right colors and not having the right colors is bad. Or having the right affixes on gear. Like it's, yes, a, yeah. it's and, but gear rough. progression feel felt a lot more controllable as well. I mean, I don't know how many times you progress the uh, the campaign, you you go into act six, you realize that all right, I, I gotta need some fire and cold rest during this act, or it's gonna be real rough now. And <laughs> then uh, you realize you look through a gear and you're still using a topaz ring from act three in your in one of your ring slots that's blue. Uh, you know, and you, you didn't get an essence or whatever, you prioritize that in the other items. In PvE 2, I can look at my items and be like, that item is so outdated right now for where I'm at in my progression. So I cannot use my gold to go to the gambler if I don't find one from the vendors. And I can see if I can get a better ring. So I can deterministically, not target farm, but I can target acquire items that are potentially direct upgrades to my character. So I feel like it, it was a smoother and more effective way to to progress the character gear which is kind of the whole point with the rpg anyways and i think that as well is a very good point for new and newer players in general together with the fact that they don't yeah. have to think about oh they gamble this item but if they don't get the right sockets i still can't use it but that's taken away as well so it really connects really well in terms of progression on that end at least yeah i think like the biggest nightmare was when i was playing corrupting fever the socket was so bad that you would always end up in like act 10 with like four white items on <laughs> you just, yeah. the only thing you care about is the sockets it was terrible but yeah do you think that so the majority of the power moved to like some gear and passive tree do you think that like removing that much friction from 
you know, the sockets and stuff, is that going to kind of shake the reputation that PoE has as being, like, really, like, complicated and, like, that kind of thing? Or do you think that'll just, like, carry over and... I mean, as a guide writer for online, like, there's only three things to worry about now. Give them the tree, give them the support gems. You don't even have to give them the best ones. Just give them the options, right? This is the best ones, sex, mess, third best. Sure. And then give them a, a list of mods that they want, potentially, on each slot. That's it. That's all you need, right? That's true. That's fair. You're ready to go. Yeah, I just do worry about the passive tree, because, like, if a lot of your power does come from the passive tree, if a lot of your, like, offensive power comes from it, I do worry that, like, with respect costs, like, being in PoE fashion just, like, really high, that's, like, maybe, like, the last friction point left for, like, new players that really, like, get discouraged when that's they, like, make wrong choices or something. I know a lot of Lawyer. people have been talking about the idea of making it more friendly to get into the, during the campaign part. Uh, some suggestions have been thrown around. One of them that I reluctantly actually think is a good idea now, of giving it some thought, is to have the idea of free respects up to a certain level. I agree. I, yeah. I don't want it as an ARPG veteran, I will say that right now, but I think it would be great for the longevity of the game and for casual players to explore themselves and realize that, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but it's okay because I can change around and play around with my tree now until to a certain level and test this and realize, oh, well, this will work better. Unless they, of course, want to follow a guide. Because right now in PoE 1, most people would say, uh, welcome to the last game you'll ever play, but you got to follow a build guide the first thing you're going to do. Otherwise, you're going to waste your first 100 hours. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, but if they allow those things, that would allow people to engage with the game without spending a few hours reading a book about how it works, right? I mean, okay, let's let's explore that and experiment there. Let's say that uh, PoE 1, they give you free respects until you kill Kitaba, which seems reasonable. Like five, Act 5 Kitaba? We'll just say Act 10. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, let's so just... Level 70 or 68 or something? Yeah, let's let's yeah. say that. And let's say it's the same in PoE 2, right? My immediate thought as a player who plays, like, you know, kind of, like, a lot is... Hot swapping. Yeah, I'll, I will play the best leveling build, fully spec it out in all the way optimal way, and then as soon as, right before I get to Katara, I'll swap over my proper build. Is yeah, that... yeah, I would do that as well. I think yeah. most of us veterans would do that, which would present us. I don't think they want that. Is that problematic? I mean, or what about that is problematic? I mean, I have no problem with it, but do they want that? I, I don't know. It's, there's only going to be one of that. There's going to be six builds then, of 12 for the different classes that people will play for leveling, and then everyone just transforms for the last boss. Sure, but you also have to keep in mind the other aspect of it that. I mean, like you mentioned earlier, like I think most of us spend, most of the veterans would spend anywhere between four and five up to ten, maybe twelve hours. Uh, I think most experienced players would spend on the campaign, which is a fraction of the time we would then spend on the end game. Yeah. So if that's that play style would be the the play style we'd uh, adapt to or adopt for the veteran players, I think that's fine, as long as that uh, feature or that approach to the game would help the new and newer players get into the game. Because right now it feels like it's they open the skill tree and then they want to install two minutes later, yeah. uh, or they they play the game and they keep dying and they can't do anything because they don't have regrets to change their tree around and they have no tools to work with to engage with it if they chose not to follow a build guide, and they just uninstall for that reason. It just keeps going and going. So like Chris Wilson said quite some time ago, when we have or, uh, when they have like player peaks, that's not new players. That's just a, a larger amount of returning players. So they, they have a very small of, uh, amount of actual generic growth of new players. It's very, very small in the game. PoE 2 will now have with the marketing the fact that people that played many years ago when there was desync issues, the OS macros and whatnot, they haven't returned to the game because their experience was always the you know, desync uh, fiesta game. But now with PoE 2 with being the brand, they will come back and try it out because you know they're going to give it a shot because then those issues are surely fixed now, right? But if they can't maintain and keep those players because it's so detrimental to new and new and newer players, not just casual, but mostly new and newer players, if they can't keep those players to try things out and engage with the game in a way that will actually be, uh, let's just use the word playable for that type of player, because APOE is a very advanced ARPG, and it, it, that doesn't have to be taken away by these features, yeah. because we're talking about a very small portion of the game. PoE starts after the campaign, right? It's, what do you think That's about how it? I feel. Some, you have some player right in, let's say, he levels to like 30, 40, 50, whatever, and he, like, you know, his passive tree is really messed up, like, and he wants to respect, and his characters break. Like, realistically, what happens if they want to respect? Quit. They quit. Yeah. yeah. There's no. I, mean, I, I think free respects is fine. I'm not sure if Act 10 Kitava is the is the play, but I think that if we, if we refer to yeah. how PoE 1 is, like, obviously. Yeah. It's a spec so, arm, right? Yeah. You go somewhere I mean, in the there, there, there's there's got to be some sort of, like, 
middle ground where they can say, well, up to this point, you can do whatever you want, play around with it. People can engage with it and try new things out. But, uh, you know, a lot of warning signs saying, well, now you're about to hit the point where you're not going to be able to respec anymore or whatnot. Just do that. And that would solve so many issues for new players coming in. I, from my perspective, I mean, obviously, this is just speculations and assumptions and personal opinions, but still. There was a rumor that the mobile tree, which was PV2, I think... It was tiny. The mo I played the mobile too. Yeah. It was like, but apparently there was no life nodes on it. Yeah, what? I didn't actually look through all the nodes, but it, the tree was small, like, and it was separated by class. Like, it was no longer the PoE tree where they're all connected. It's just like there was a a witch tree, and there was like I don't know thirty forty points in that witch area, and they right. didn't connect at all to the other hmm. stuff. Interesting, but yeah, I heard there was no life nodes in it. I didn't actually check for that. I mean, if there's a world in which no there's no life nodes on the PoE two tree as well, I mean, doesn't that kind of fix the new player problem as well? Because like, yeah, okay, they picked the wrong damage nodes, maybe, which aren't... Or utility options. Or, uti I mean, or utility options, which aren't the most efficient, but the one thing which really hamstrings a build, and where you, like, walk in and you're dead, is because you didn't take life nodes, right? Or proper defensive layers, yeah, in PoE. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if it's only damage and mechanical changes, maybe they can get away with not having the respec stuff. I mean, I think if they make a huge effort to, like, address those kinds of concerns that you're bringing up it would be fine like and it would reduce a lot of friction i, I think my biggest concern was from you know poe1 to poe2 is like if they have poe2 be poe1 with all of its complexities and the passive tree and like all of these things that you know that it carries with it the really complex game but at the same time the gameplay is like slower more methodical and maybe a little more punishing because it's like it's a harder game i think definitely in terms of its moment to moment gameplay that i don't know like if that it might be a, catering to an even smaller audience than PoE One has. That's my concern, right? Because it's it has all the complexity. It still has that that uh, stigma, maybe, of it of being a super complex game. But at the same time, it's harder and you know more punishing. It's kind of like the concern, I think. I also that, think it's harder because we like experience in it. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of the difficulty was gated behind the reactive gameplay. Yep. Because once you learn the, the momentum, the the pacing, the rhythm of the things, yep. like I, a prime example for me, uh, taking the monk as I would look at, uh, talking about the sorcerers, I encountered one of the bosses in some marshy area, uh, I know what it was, like a, a bunch of skeletons. Uh, there were these uh, big blobs that spawned uh, the flying things. Um, there was a boss there that had a mechanic where he spawned some ants, but he also spawned some volatile balls that flew through you. That fight, I had so much trouble since I started. I blew through all of my life flies, all my mana flies were gone. And then I was like, okay, well, I actually got to pay attention to what's happening. And so I had like 10 HP left, no blasts whatsoever, no way to recover them for that matter. And I just turned away my, my map to the, to the top corner. It literally was incentivized to not have the map overlay for the first time just to learn the fight. And then I was literally just focusing on dodging. And once I got that, I'm waiting for my regen to happen. I did the rest of the fight without any life flask and I never got hit. Simply yeah. because I learned the rhythm of it, the yeah. pacing. And I, I never died to the fight. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> but, you know, but all about getting to that point where, okay, I got the rhythm in. I understand the mechanics now. I can reliably and real, like deterministically actually dodge and play this and not take damage unless I you know, do a risky move. And that's, that's on me in that case. Mm -hmm. And that felt really good, and that allows you to to encounter these fights and your personal gamer skills, if you will, is what dictates your efficiency rather than the build itself, right? That's how I felt about it. I agree. So the difficulty seems to be gated on that end, which I think is really good. No, I definitely felt like I had a lot of control. I felt like I could dodge all of the bosses' attacks, yeah, which mm -hmm. I don't think is true in PoE one bosses. Like sometimes Absolutely you, get, not. <laughs> you just get hit by stuff. Like, but yeah. in in PoE two, it definitely was like I could dodge. I could do like hitless runs of the boss, like that kind of thing. Yeah. If I was playing it right. Yeah. The the thing that I don't. Did you guys um get to the the Mervile fight? The, I the one on Warrior. Warrior. No, no, the the one with the balls that they showed. They showcased that one on stream. That one was like you could dodge everything. But uh, it had energy shield, and so the yeah. thing it was doing is it was regening its energy shield to full, and then you'd hit it like a couple times, five times, whatever, and then it would jump back in the water oh. and regen all of its energy shield. And I was just like, oh god. But if you were ranged, you would have been able to smash it. You can't. No, it's in, it goes invulnerable when it's in the water. No, but you would have been able to do more damage so that you could actually deal damage to its real life instead of just its energy. Oh sure, shield. yeah, yeah, for sure. But 
there's some of the bosses that are like doing that kind of thing where they go like immune they they brought back the immune phases like <laughs> they do yeah. it <laughs> i mean that's what they do right <laughs> so the immune phases are back but yeah the i definitely felt the bosses were, were definitely like you could dodge them and, and outplay them for sure all right like... yeah i mean for sure i, I agree so if I were to ask both of you guys, with all your experience of PV2, having granted it being limited, project yourself forward to the beta, um, true or false, people will get the beta and they will completely slaughter it and there will be completely broken builds that trivialize their entire game. Oh yeah. 100%. True? In the current iteration of what we've seen, absolutely. I think the game is, they're bringing all the complexities of PoE one and all the crazy stuff that you can do. Like surely there's some really crazy stuff. So you reckon that there's going to be exactly like how we saw that race? People are going to do it in like three hours, the whole thing, six, six acts. I don't know about the timing, but uh, especially us being incentivized to do all of the side stuffs. But it's like you mentioned, like Spark, getting Herald, I mean, you're yeah. good. You're, you're steamrolling now. Like, there's no yeah. point in clicking anything else. Whereas uh, yeah. other classes might have a different, different approach to it, sure, and uh, other obstacles they need to encounter to tackle. But again, you know, we don't know how it's going to be when the beta comes, but like from the current iteration, yeah. if this was us going into beta, I definitely think we would have things that would just completely be destroying everything. Yeah, yeah. It's just we don't have access to the passive tree, which presumably is like where a lot of our power is coming from. So we don't have a ton of control, and we yeah. barely had access to support gems. Yeah, well. the gems. Yeah, we couldn't choose which gems like we're yeah. getting, so that was kind of limiting. But so if we've established that, we're we're, we're pretty much all on the same page that there's pretty much no way there's not going to be broken builds, right? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, and like if you add party play into that, there's just there's yeah, no chance they're balancing it. It's there's a zero percent. But that's chance. by design. Like they kind of want, I think, to like have this kind of game that can be cracked wide open, or maybe they don't. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. It, it undermines what they were saying. Yeah, I yeah. think they like they stated but that. What was the scaling the... of parties? Because that's something I never heard. I oh, have no idea. I don't. Because <laughs> in PoE, it's uh, what 100 percent unique per player, right? Yeah. In and HP only. In HP. Yeah. But in the in PoE's campaign, I'm not sure if you're familiar. You can do boss tagging, yeah, which is a thing that yeah. you can do where you have one person walk in and in the campaign. Well, only, we do that in maps as well, right? You cannot do it in maps. If you invite them afterwards, it's they okay. have, they, it, it in maps it updates the boss's HP to whatever scaler in a percent the, wise. Correct. So yeah, so you bring them down to the culling range. You can do people that. In, yeah. yeah, but in um, I didn't actually know about that. In the campaign, you can tag a boss or activate it or wake it up and then mm. bring in six people or whatever and they have the hp of one person's effectively yeah and so you can just blow it up like immediately <laughs> so that's what we do when we burst through the yeah. campaign we yeah. basically people would spread tag. out yeah. tag their voice up and then just port everybody in and then we're but, done right but yeah but they have not shown any like multiplayer mechanics at all or how it even works i don't even know how, i don't and i don't Neo know how same. dying works like can you res people or how, do you have to wait for everybody to die in the boss sure encounter or, or... That, i don't know that's a good question because like you know the boss Actually, just does anyone in chat remember if they answer that question on q a because that must have been asked they i mean i watched the q a they didn't the boss is reset oh, okay. when you die solo like they go full hp yeah. so like if, i mean i think it's probably going to be the latter you can't revive until you talk you until die. everybody dies you can't revive yeah that would be my guess i don't know it's gonna be like i died and now i'm spectating my teammates for three minutes to kill this boss or something i mean like i mean that's kind of that's kind of cool in yeah, a way kind of, yeah like but I mean, okay, so where I was going with that, that Q&A there for you guys there is, I mean, we've established that we all think the builds are going to be broken. Yeah. Most yeah. likely. Like, I can't imagine a world in which they're not. And they're not going to be balanced. We're not going to be using combo skills unless you want to, <laughs> which you could maybe want to. And I could see a world in which you're a monk and you're using Killing Palm and it has Melee Splash and you get three power charges every time and then sure. you flick a strike everywhere, yeah. maybe. But, you know, most likely it's going to be like Spark or something um but my next question would be okay so builds are out of the way we don't have to worry about player power you might be a little bit slower on the movement speed but what i'm really curious about is item acquisition because that is something which has been changed the most like, i agree it's not even remotely similar i don't know how they're going to handle crafting at all because there's no crafting bench they they said that and a lot of the crafting tools we know from poe one are just straight up deleted like there's yeah. no alts there's no scours we don't know if stuff like bestiary like this kind of thing is coming along it's a big question yeah. mark, and uh, I mean, are they going to change essences to be similar to chaos orbs? So that are essence yeah. not going to remove a random mod and add its essence mod yeah. on the item, or it's going to be the old essence? Like, there's so many question marks, and I don't think that it's like I said before. Like, we need to see uh, the painting that they have the vision for, and so we can understand the steps are taken. Because right now, 
There's so many so many stuff that we have no idea what they're gonna do, and I, I don't think they know. Yeah. I don't think they know. That's why we don't like. I think minion stuff was the same yeah. thing there. We know the philosophy uh, they want well, though. We yeah. can see it. <laughs> can because right now you can't. Are there regal orbs? I actually don't remember there being. Didn't see regal orbs. Didn't mention it. That I know. I know there's art for it, but I don't. If, if there are, there's cut like new art. Yeah, there's the art with all the new orbs. Like there was a regal orb with the new art. Then the living be, be really what they're they yeah. gonna do. We don't know. You know. Was, was there exalt and divine? I don't recall. I can't remember. Oh, okay. I have to imagine. No, there, apparently there was exalt and null and maybe regal. I know Exalted and all are definitely in. Someone told me so, on the floor. What did they, um, because you can't, uh, go back to your blue item. Like, once it's a, a rare is a rare, it's like always yeah, a rare. Yeah, you can't go wide yeah. mm -hmm. So what is the item acquisition path? Do you get, like, a good blue item and then regal, or what's well, the... this is what I discussed with Tuna. So, the way I saw it, which immediately got disproved when I rewatched the Q&A by Jonathan, thanks Jonathan, um, was that you'll pick up items, that's sure. one way. There is the Gambler, which mm. I would have thought would have been a big part of it because you can get gold in endgame and the vendor scales to, with you. Sure. So you can use gold to get items. Uh, and Oh, to add to that, yeah. um, I think it was James. Yeah. Uh, scrap the names. One of the GG devs said that there would definitely be people playing gold find. Okay, so pretty much so. confirmed gold will be a... A thing in endgame, yeah? Yeah. That goes against everything they've said for a decade, but okay. Yeah, was I was very bad. surprised to hear that. Yeah. It's very surprising. The, like, how true it is, I don't know, but one of the devs said that people would definitely be playing gold fine. Like, okay. In oh. endgame. <laughs> in endgame, for sure. That's, just... That's what they said. Okay. Well, one guy said, mind you. Okay. So, <laughs> so if we, the only items you're going to want to use are rare and unique, right? Obviously, like, yeah, right? Sure. So there's picking it up on floor, gambling for it, or alking into it, slash chancel. That those are the three ways that you can currently acquire them without leaving Tenex. And then after that you know, yeah, yeah. And then after you do that, you can manipulate them with chaos, chaos, exalts, and annuls. A chaos is a remove ad now. It's a slam ad. Yeah, it's a yeah, remove it's ad. Uh, it's a bit hard to read chat, by the way. So that's why we're not really paying attention to it too much, guys. But I think it's also someone right that divines are apparently in as well. Nice. Okay, well that, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. So the it, it it's pretty limited. So what I was curious, really about especially from you snap is what are you cooking what what is the way you would make money in that kind of a system so the the it's gold man it's, it's, it's gold that's why i also gold. thought it's gold you just get five billion gold and you sit on the vendor and you gamble for if, uniques and if the vendor has the potential to give you end game viable items then hoarding and trading gold is going to be the way that you can basically trade. but but the problem with that is that jonathan straight after i said that on the opener of day two he's like <laughs> No one's going to use gold. That's like picking up wisdom scrolls. And I was like, what? Really? Because well, it's like a chaos orb in my eyes. Right now, the, right now, the vendor in POE 1 cannot give you anything good. It doesn't have influence. Yeah. It's like not linked. It's, like, it's not high eye level. Like those kind of restrictions. Mm. But, I, I yeah. asked a dev though, and he said it's basically Gwenin. If it's like that, then gold is the currency you trade with. That's. It's going to be the gold standard, which is chaos. Well. Chaos orbs in the start, and for a lot of uh, one percent game chasers, if you want divine orbs, I mean, yeah, you'll be buying chaos orbs, in theory, right? Yeah, but so what are you gonna? What, so what? Yeah, so okay, so you're farming gold. Yeah, we're farming gold to give to him, and he buys items from the vendor. Yeah, yeah. and then I craft them those. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be like the loop, right? I'm also farming sure that's gold. Gonna be like item gold. level, uh, you know, craft is gonna fix that obviously, and make sure we have a list of the optimized item levels that you want. Which is gonna make us have that one character that presents the items from the gamble is gonna scale with your character. Oh Jesus! So okay. Now we're gonna have to level up at all. So oh, it's gonna God. be a very specific level, so you can gamble the craft oh, bases no. on that character. Oh God! I mean, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, if me and you are farming gold, right? I mean, that's kind of a problem for me because you have party scaling and MF, and I don't. I mean, maybe I have to wear MF now as well. Then I don't even know. They haven't actually shown like I know they said MF or whatever rarity is in the game still like at least alluded to that much yeah. but it does something different than what it does in the first game because oh, okay. actually one more question did you guys know if they said anything about like loot is not personal I didn't, they said know. it works exactly the same in one of the q a's they gold did, as well they it works the exact same way as it does in the first game where i'm okay. assuming if you have so free the for first all, person that's going to run it, over is going to pick it up it's going to auto play <laughs> i mean if you have free for all on it's going to be yeah it's yeah. going to be whoever runs it over yeah. first if it's 
permanent allocation. <laughs> it's equally parsed because you always run free for all, right? Well, you have to. Yeah, of course. But you have to like you have to agree beforehand, like okay, this is how we're splitting, like this kind of. Yeah. Thing. You mean the really carry is gonna be picking up everything, you know, whoever's in the front. Yeah, that's fine. You just Jeez. you put in the guild stash anyways. And then yeah, but that person's gonna have room for anything else but gold if you do a gold yeah. parse. <laughs> A gold. Oh my god. No, I mean, this... we, don't, we don't know very much about the gold besides that, or magic find, besides that they said that gold or whatever rarity is still in the game. That's what yeah. they said. And yeah. I think they said also that they're moving away from quantity. They said specifically they want to move away from quant. So we have right. rarity. Which... That would also incentivize more boss rushing. Yeah. Which I'm a big fan That's of. That's what they said. They said yeah. that if you get a bunch of rarity, you can get like better currencies from the bosses. Like that is one thing that they okay. said. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, if the. Because. The entire economy revolves around what the best items are, right? You would know that better mm -hmm. than anyone, right? Mm -hmm. And if the best items are acquired by rolling them with gold, then gold is like <laughs> the, uh, the the currency farm, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I do. It's I the do. de facto currency, right? That's, Sorry, it's thanks. the de facto currency if that's how you get the items. Yeah, uh, the only thing that's going to be a bit annoying because they've already in theory one removed the way to level down level your character, so whatever breaking right, point for certain bases means that you're gonna like if you're crafting yeah. several like if you're chasing these craft items either to sell the base itself or craft on them i mean take convoking ones for example they can drop at 72 but if you translate that to if i were to acquire them through gold if i want to have a cheapest way to craft these things i would have to level a character to exactly 72 park that in, in the town and take out gold to buy ones with that one don't you have and, to level or reset though to reset the vendor you're talking about i thought you had to level or you do certain with the gambler the gambler or? is infinite is yeah. it infinite? I'd actually... You can just control, click, 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 Really click, a click, whole click. inventory of items? Yeah, yeah. inventory. He doesn't Smack like that. No, no, no. I stacked. <laughs> well, maybe it changes. I thought it was like the other... I didn't buy very much from the gambler, to be honest. I didn't engage with the gambler too much, but he's I didn't know you... He's got his uh, bank rolling him, so he's good, man. <laughs> so you can buy one base type that's good and just buy like an infinite amount of yeah. that. So, I mean, if it scales with your character, you're going to have characters. At least, I mean, obviously, this is not something casual players would do. This is for... You know, people that want to buy a base to sell a basis, or they would literally have um, for the crafters that would want specific bases to craft them. They would have to level a card to a certain level and then buy the gold and just smack that up. But if you want to craft several bases and there's different item levels on those, you would then have to have your party or yourself mm -hmm. level several characters up to a certain level. That's gonna be something people will be very upset with if it goes if that's the the, the game we'll see when it I mean, goes into beta next year all right let me let me play devil's advocate here let's say that because we absolutely know gold is going to be working the way we know right now at least let's say that it caps at act six which is like what item level 68 sure and you can only buy <laughs> item level 68 items with gold uh does that create an interesting economy because you can get probably the most solid base items for that like you know there'll be like rings and stuff like that with tier two tier three mods on them but then only the good stuff will drop in maps which you have to id i mean that's probably the best solution right because they well, surely yeah. their philosophy is they want the best items to drop from the hardest content and that is in right like, yeah hopefully that, that yeah. is surely the philosophy that, yeah <laughs> i mean that's kind of true in poe one where you have just simply item levels scaling with better mods and that yeah. kind of accomplishes the job at least that's to a degree that's true so i imagine they have the solution is just capping the eye level in the vendor to not be able to give you the best stuff. Yes, yeah. that's that's done. True. Um, anything else we want to add to the crafting parts and whatnot? Yes, I mean, I I want to hear what you have to say about what you're even gonna do with the chaos orbs. Are you even gonna <laughs> Are you even gonna craft stuff? Are you gonna snipe it off of the trade side? Like, are you? It's just gambling, right? It well, it is gambling. Um, I mean, it's impossible to tell without having all the information and what yeah. other crafting mechanic other crafting tools we have available to us so without that information it's impossible to tell uh, i guess to somewhat answer the question with the information that we have available to us uh, i would assume that if the gambler scales to our level we would then look at which modifiers you want on an item and you would have a level of that character to make that optimized and you would mass buy that item and if that well, isn't the case and it needs caps you would then have to find those items which means you have to buy them with the mods but you know either way what you're looking for no matter how you're acquiring the item you're looking for an item that has you know uh, all about one or two of the stats and then you would chaos orb that and pray it removes that one or two bad mods and gets that one extra good so you have a all about one mod uh, modifier item that's really good so you can sell or that perfect full slotted item with modifiers that's good for the build. And you obviously have the next level of RNG, which would be the tier of what you just got and the tier of mods on the base you have. I mean, 
It, I, I, I feel like I don't know. <laughs> if the item acquisition turns into you at a vendor, that'll just get changed. Like that is just so antithetical to like everything GG's like ever talked yeah. about with items that if that actually becomes a case even by accident or whatever, they'll just change it. I'm sure they're not. Yeah. Gonna, they're not gonna allow that to persist. I think MP was in the chat earlier saying that uh, he's still in it. How you doing, MP? Uh, he said Alcorbs was guaranteeing four modded rares or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. Like I think that when it comes to the crafting aspect. We would need to, we would need to have them go out and tell us this is what we're aiming for, and also give us a hint or at least tell us what the plans are for the other crafting mechanics that we have available in PE one. Yeah. Because PE one when we started, it was these basic currencies that we've now been provided the information on. But as the years have gone, we have essence, we have the best theory, so yeah, so much, fossil. so many. I mean, it, obviously that's very bloated on that end, which is kind of detrimental. So the question is, are they going to keep all of it or are they going to only have maybe one or two of it or none of it? Maybe? I think them removing alts and like the scours specifically, I think it signifies that they're just pulling all of that back. I think they want it to be a more simple system because I think crafting in PoE is like one of the most complicated things in the entire game. Yep. To like, learn, but once you have it, it, it's very easy once you learn it, but you have to take that initial step go yeah. through you know poe university once you graduate <laughs> that you'll you'll have an easy time with it <laughs> people talk about the complexity of poe it's like oh, the passive tree the, the atlas tree blah 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 and then you tell them okay well look at crafting like that's the <laughs> real like it's just a it's a rabbit hole but it kind of depends it. on what kind of crafting you're looking at because yeah. crafting is very easy like low end or even medium end sure. you know, it's really hard to talk about budget levels because everyone is very subjective and that's depending on what you're asking uh but like easy crafts are very easy little more advanced crafts are pretty easy to get a grasp on next step is like you know that's a big leap for mankind before you get to that <laughs> yeah. part and then there's another even bigger leap in there and then you go from there and you have these you know multi-link weapons you got to hit the beast with a certain light a certain beast level to get a certain modifier on an item that can't actually roll that because of the easier hit with another item level on it then you're you know you're at, you're at the moon already you know that's true. i don't even do those crafts because i think they're way too annoying um but that's just when it comes to the crafting aspect and then definitely when we talked about earlier uh, how it would be good for the game to be more casual friendly maybe it's good that they start off poe2 without all of these mechanics and then they add what would be fitting for that itemization which is very different from poe1 maybe that's a good call, best call for them to do i don't know yeah i mean i think i mean tuna tuna put this pretty well when i was talking to him so he said that he doesn't mind being slow as long as he can be faster than other people right and i kind of feel like that's the way it is for crafting as well the reason i feel bad about having to craft a bow and i the reason i do it is because that's the best item in the game if the best item in the game can be found on the floor i'm not going to feel bad that i find it on the floor you know what i mean that's true so like i'm going to enjoy farming stuff off the floor because i have a chance to get the best item in the game fair but speaking of best bow in the game you spent 17 mirrors to have that bow for you <laughs> oh i'm sorry man i mean the... actually uh, i think I think Belton or someone finished it in over 50 Belton, mirrors. Yeah, Belton finished this bow. 50 mirrors oh, or something shit. is what I spent. And I thought I spent 17 when we gave up. I was yeah. like, oh, I'm sorry, Graham, I'm so sorry. We're not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, no, no, no one could ever do that without, you know, having like massive amounts of resources at their disposal yeah. but it's a community craft basically yeah like, yeah like, we didn't want to do that with our group we've done it once but like you know grim was telling me asking me oh uh you're gonna do this i'm like yeah i got you man i got you <laughs> we just spent everything we had on it and after 17 mirrors it was still imprinted with a blue item from one one <laughs> and a metacraft actually yeah. so it metacraft it and imprinted with a metacraft mind you <laughs> 17 mirrors later he got nowhere <laughs> yeah i mean I don't know, like, I mean, yeah, that's just, like, like, with the whole, like, brute forcing stuff with mirrors and stuff like that, I, I mean, that's still going to be somewhat a thing, right? I think it will be. Absolutely. I, mean, I don't think that will ever change. But it'll be, I feel like, in PBA 1, you have so many tools to mitigate the RNG. I just don't know that we know what kind of things are introducing in PBA yeah, 2. That, don't know. There's no beasts, or at least that we know of, right? It's... Well, truly, we don't know what there's they no imprinting. imprinting like what is crafting gonna look like there's no imprinting <laughs> there's no yeah, way there's imprinting like, <laughs> i think that like <laughs> no a, way a lot of it the, the a lot of these shows, especially with crafting and whatnot obviously without a dev to go yeah, through yeah. To, to ask we end up in a in a, in this category or this little gray zone where the majority of it's based on speculations and expectations i just yeah they didn't talk about it much in the the dev interviews like about crafting no else. they didn't there wasn't really much. it's like you said also it's it's one of those things that scary kind of re 
moves the interest for new and new players because they see this, you know, uh, Bible book that they have to go through and understand yeah, it, yeah, right? For sure. So I think that might be a, been a smart thing. I mean, I don't, I don't um, think it's good to do that. I don't think the Bible, it, it's so bad for new players, right? Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Uh, but taking the crafting aside, uh, we're kind of tight on the time because we uh, we are going to a uh, dinner later and uh, they're picking us up in uh, about 50 minutes. Um, shall we maybe touch upon the topic of the split of PV1 PV and PV2 since that's been a pretty controversial topic? Sure. What do you guys feel? Can you start with Snap? It, I, I mean, after playing the demo, all I can say is like, it makes sense. It is so clear to me that there are just irreconcilable differences between the two games. There is not a bridge like that they could cross to make these two games the same without, as they said, like making one part of the player base really upset. Mm. it's just the games are so different they're just very different yep. they're they're two different games that's all i can say well, at the same time they they spent years talking about it. it's the same game but two different campaigns and in the uh, announcement they just completely walked back on that i was like whoa yeah it's i was not prepared for that at all what's your take uh i mean for me like period one's kind of been like, like if you think about a car right you know it's got a red line and it's like redlining right and that's bad I feel like PUE One's kind of been redlining on power for a long time now. Like they keep adding stuff, but then they have to take it away, and people get pissed off because the game's kind of added its, its limit. Like some, you can move so fast in PUE One that, like, you you, you know, you, you can't control your character. <laughs> like you've seen it. Like, no, I mean, it's it's. You don't think so? I I I mean I I agree. Obviously, there's like you get so powerful so fast. Like so everything in PUE the numbers are so high, but like so we're I, talking about it being D- yeah. Diablo esque at that point. I kind of enjoy that, but I think that's fine. Like I can mm-hmm. play that and play PUE and then just like take a break and then come yeah. back like next league and it's. I don't know. Really I feel fun. like I've been kind of like I I go through the the available content faster and faster and faster the more and more power creep that's in. I don't know about you. But I mean, to us, like, we're able to play for whatever 16 hours and then for, like, a week or whatever, and then that's, like, all the content. But that's, like, a lot of time for your average person to, like, go through all that stuff. That's true as well. It's a lot of yeah. time. I mean, I guess the kind of where I was going with that is that um, I'm kind of glad that the split happened because you to, to, to get back to a point in which you can kind of develop the the game and kind of yeah. take the steps of power creep slowly again yeah you would have had to reset 10 years of power creep and that if, would not have worked if they had to cater to the old you know the poe one loving community with like the zoom zoom if they had to cater to those people to try and like develop poe2 like it would just be they just couldn't there's no way i don't think it's an impossible task to reconcile those two games yeah they're so different in in every way like fundamentally that yeah i mean i i saw a comment on reddit which uh was actually really good. It, it does happen, uh, apparently. Oh, wow. It said the <laughs> D4 is so bad, GGG had to make another game to compete with itself. Oh, man. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I don't know. They're like, two different products. Yeah, I really yeah think, like, for sure. Definitely. But I think, like, with the idea that they're catering to uh, the two different play styles uh, or player bases. I think it's really good because they have the funding, they have the staff to be able to pull it off. And something that a lot of people actually don't understand, I had a discussion with uh, Quinn uh, Nugi and um, uh, Taita Killer uh, on breakfast this morning. And, uh, and one of the things that, that was presented in that discussion was the leap slam, for example. Mm. Every leap slam you do in PV1 right now, it, it looks different depending on the weapon you're using. Uh, and every single class, will look different in the way they are moving animation wise and that's streamlined in poe2 so that all of the classes will be able to do the, the same type of animation plus the weapon type of, obviously in that case as well which makes it much easier for them to develop uh, to develop the things it's going to be faster for them to make changes or introduce new things to the game so it's going to be a much different type of approach to it so it seems with those type of changes that they're doing in the engine with what they have for PoE2 allows them to develop it in a, in a much better pace, I guess, but a different pace nonetheless. Yeah. Um, and they can have these two different types of uh, games and, and uh, they're gonna run on what we are assuming three month cycles, uh, staggered so they don't crash into one another, obviously. Uh, and um, I think it's gonna be good. Obviously there are some concerns with what's gonna happen if one game eats up the other, uh, yeah. other game's player base. And especially when it comes to trade league, I mean, we all know first month is great. Yep. Second month, it's just going down unless there's a big launch, for example. Let's look at um, 
a few months ago we had a league launch and you know it was trade was really good most people play trade so we're going to refer to that so right and we play trade so we're up here and everything's trade is really good and then it starts going down a little bit then d4 happens and there's a large portion of the player base start start playing it we don't see a, a decline going down it's a the free fall and mm -hmm. then it goes down from that point on right and i think that might be something we'll see happening with a, a PUE one launch happening so we have PUE two two months later it's PUE one that's going to be a brick wall and that free fall is going to happen so instead of a three-month lease, it feels more like a two-month lease. So there's definitely concerns on that end. Uh, and the other part of it is what happens if PUE2 is uh, booms and is so successful in the community that people that like the Zoom Tune playstyle feels that they're getting that, satisf uh, that's that um, satisfaction from PUE2 that they don't even want to go into PUE1. Mm. Then you have another problem because essentially, if you want to play both games, you only get one month of PUE1 before you're back on PUE2, right? Yeah. So, uh, but then again, uh, if both are successful, the games, the company's going to grow and just kind yeah. of make so much money, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, it's good in the end, I, I would say. But at the same time, if it, let's just present the situation where PUE2 eats up the player, PUE1 player base so, so much that it's only 10, 15, 20% of the player base playing PUE1, they can literally just move, move resources into PUE2 and say, well, okay, now we're going to run six months leagues in PUE1 instead to lower that and basically you know, treat that as a graveyard or something that's that yeah. might happen in the future we don't know uh, perfect world is like they have the two products they run in parallel there's a somewhat proportional number of devs that are going to both products and they both like have the staggered cycle and they release and it's all great like that's the perfect world right they yeah. have the zoomy whatever blasting poe one they have the slower more methodical like you know more tactical poe two and then they both have their own kind of like somewhat separate thing going on and then the worst case scenario is like one of them cannibalizes the other that's the other end of the spectrum at the same time they can also step back on what people a very large okay to to be real here a very large portion of the vocal community uh, right. for peewee has been saying buff the underused ability on the, the bad abilities and don't nerf the high end bring up the low end now if they want to they have to compromise to stay within their vision and what they want to create but with this uh, split, they're able to lead Pee One to be that point where they sure. don't have to necessarily nerf too much. And instead, they can look at, well, we can bring up the, the bad skills and create that game that a lot of people have been screaming for that they want. Don't nerf my favorite build. I want to play that over league kind of approach and potentially allow that to see how that goes for the game and its success. And that could be a fun thing. I, I personally think that that might be what they're going to do, uh, which will... For a lot of us, turn PUE one into how Diablo three worked, where you're finishing the game within a few days and you've done everything mm -hmm. and you're done, and that's okay. And then we'll have the more challenging game from PUE two for those veterans that want to do that instead. But again, it's, this is all just speculation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm okay with like the. I mean, if you're playing for like whatever 15 hours, like the grind sessions that we do, if you play that much and you finish it in three days, like that's still a lot of time. Like, Absolutely, that, like, and that's fine. I'm I'm okay with that. I personally enjoy like the cyclical nature where you just kind of like play a lot, play a lot, and then you like you stop or you slow it down. Maybe it's like an hour or two like after that. Like I enjoy that personally, which is like one of the big things about PUE is I can always come back at a later time when there's a new expansion, a new league launch. No, and, like that's that's the fun part. So I mean, me as a guide creator, yeah, them splitting it. I mean, that, that, I, I couldn't have asked for anything better. Professionally, it's probably insane. Yeah, like yeah, for so my like, business, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, now I'm going to have two different games <laughs> I can make guides for, and they're going to have launches, yeah. you know, twice within the three months plan. Instead, I mean, <laughs> I'm happy. Uh, but as a player, uh, there is definitely concerns and uh, and worries. Well, do you have anything to add to it? What's your take? Uh, yeah, so I think from a developer perspective, there was no other solution because PUE 2's palatable is about a 3 out of 10, and <laughs> PUE 1's. An 11 out of 10. <laughs> and the way that PUE 1, what I was trying to allude to earlier, kind of works is it goes 11 out of 10, 12 out of 10, 11 out of 10, 12 out of 10, because they, they, they make something insane and then they nerf it and then it makes yeah. something insane. And it kind of goes back and forwards. It feels like, at least for me, between those two things. Uh, and I think as a player, though, like if I didn't make content, um, I would prefer it just to be one game, personally. Just really? a really good game. As a player, I would I would personally see that as well. I disagree. That's I just would like having the games be different. I think is like the best solution. I, I and like maybe I would enjoy that because I personally wouldn't want the PUE gameplay experience to be like. I like the zoom. I like the fast thing. I wouldn't want that gameplay to be compromised because they want to have a different product, which is PUE two. I wouldn't want them to compromise on that. 
Yeah, I mean, that's why I, I said there's like, there's, like, no other option. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, I yeah, completely yeah. agree. There's literally no choice. Yeah. yeah. There was irreconcilable sure. as, like, the only... But, no, I agree yeah. with that. But you also mentioned that you're the kind of player that's, like, you go crazy, you stop playing. Yeah. I mean, that's Both fine. me as a content creator or, or as well, or the guy creator, as well as a gamer, I, I don't play a game, well, not many games at least, where I just play for a short burst of time and then I stop and then I come back a couple of months later. Like the way Android PoE is, you consistently mm. play it, and so I don't have that stop. I, I have a diminishing effect on the amount of hours I'm pushing after the sure. initial yeah. burst, right? Um, but then I want to keep playing it and be in, in, in entertained by it, and um, so I don't get those breaks into another launch uh, in the same way. So I guess it, I guess it's um, perspective differences there. For sure. I mean, it's just how you enjoy the game, right? Yeah. Like, you can't tell anybody else to enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, you know? I mean, like, that, that's kind of what I was, like, 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 like I kind of imagine myself, like, like, I don't make content, I'm, like, working, like, a 9-to-5 job, right? Um, You know, I would pick one or the other. I would yeah. pick, like, both, personally. That would yeah. be me. It's a lot of, a lot of time investment, right? It's yeah, like, I mean, Pee-wee, yeah. it's like, it, like, not just, like, um, playing the game, but mastering the game, like, it consuming external videos and stuff like that. Like I, I would, I'd like to be good at the game I play as well. So yeah. I don't have, I wouldn't have time to play both. So mm. I think, I mean, maybe that's gonna be a problem for them. Maybe it's not. I don't know. We're a long way out though. I mean, beta is in just under a year. So yeah, preliminary. If you so okay. to change, <laughs> here's an interesting one. If you had to pick one, which one would you pick? Having played and kind of having an understanding of where it's going, which one would you pick if you had to play one? I pick. Me personally, I listen. I'm the zoomer I'm through and through. Like I'm going, I'm blasting. It would be PO1, but that's just me. Like, PO1, some okay. people really like the like slower, methodical gameplay. Yeah, which is weird because I really like like Soulsborne games and like mm-hmm. those kind of like really hard, like that just pounds you in and just is like really difficult. Um, but yeah, I would still play PO1. It's just interesting. That's yeah, actually very it, interesting. It, it is interesting. It's okay, like, what are you guys think? Crafting and ma- mastering uh, crafting and uh, minions took me quite a few years before I could firmly say that I like I, I know the ins and outs. Then there obviously changes and sometimes I forget things. But to get to the point where I felt like hey I can I, I cannot master these things mm. uh, and I feel really good about it. it. Took me so long and that journey. Not to sound too much like Rod Ferguson here, but it's not <laughs> about the destination, it's the journey. But we're not talking about balance changes here. Yeah. Um, I feel like that was a very, very entertaining journey for me to go through. Yeah. So I would say PeeWee 2 for that reason, because that would rekindle what started PeeWee 1 for me in, in the initial baseline when I started playing nine years ago. Interesting. So that feels for me like if I, if I had to choose, PeeWee 2 would give me that hopefully based on what we know so far yeah for at least a handful of years of going through that journey again with how that game's going and i had so much fun with that so yeah yeah there's something to be said about like the novelty like it's a new game like you're discovering new things like yeah. Pee is so discovered ins and out like every single crevice is like explored documented spreadsheet everything and like that can take away a lot of the fun out of games and like something mm-hmm. new coming out just like discovering what is the new thing that's good what is the new like method to do this and that and that is fun on its own for sure like, yeah i mean you guys you know, remember when you started playing you encountered something new and it was like whoa what's this yeah. we're so excited about it and you know you dropped your first yeah. exalt back then it was like whoa god yeah. exalted or and now it's like you, you drop well divine orbs now you drop a divine you, you automatically pick it up yeah. you don't even register yeah. that you did and you go out of the map start clearing your inventory like oh i dropped the divine like oh. it's a, it, the, the difference there is it's kind of crazy. Obviously, you'd be happy with the divide early on in the league, but I mean, as you play the game, that those those things with what you get and the mechanics you encounter with, you already know everything. You know the bosses, so you don't get the same level of excitement because yeah. it's not new. But PUE two is going to give us that at least for some time moving I, forward. I agree. Like that that feeling you get where it's like new, like that kind of thing. I definitely resonate with a lot. I just feel like once I've experienced like all of the stuff that PUE two has to offer, which will be a lot, like tons of new stuff you're doing. But after I've like probably gone through a few cycles or whatever, I'll probably end up enjoying the gameplay of Pee One more. Interesting. Just mm-hmm. because it's like way more complicated. And that's just maybe I enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can see that. But definitely like I think when it comes out, of course we're all gonna be playing Pee Wee Two. It's not like we're not gonna course. play it's like we're not gonna play because Pee Wee One's there, like, but because there's so much new stuff to experience. I'm sure it'll be a good experience regardless, even if no, you know, I one of the other. So. But we also have to keep in mind that as we're discussing these things, and they're all based of speculation, yep. based of what we yeah. know so far, which is just a fraction of the current iteration of what the game is, That's that is a lot. year out from beta, 
before yeah. we get the actual launch. So, I mean, everything can change in the, in the coming one, well, I guess, one and a half year. Uh, so, I mean, again, but uh, that's all we could do in the in the current uh, little discussion we're having and the information we have access to. But it's like you and I talked about that when we were eight earlier as well. Like it would be really nice to have the possibility to have a dev on stream and discuss and ask them questions yeah. uh, more in depth with specific topics um, to get that picture painted so we know where they're going. Yeah, because we really don't know with the end game what they're even thinking, really. They don't know. Yeah. There's a mean, whole year, man. They've got a whole year to develop it. Yeah, sure we have, we got they'll no be idea. taking feedback and input from everybody and no. going yeah. in that direction. Absolutely. We have a shuttle bus in about 25 minutes, and uh, I look like shit, so I want to get ready no for worries, that. No worries, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there it is. Do we have any uh, any closing thoughts, anything else you guys want to add? Um, I mean, just like we get both. That's my closing thoughts. <laughs> Real quick, what about the auto battler? Just like a few minutes. Oh, like, I'm a big fan of the Dota auto battler, and then yeah. that was TFT and all that. So, But I'm also very concerned about the fact that most mechanics that are similar to this, let's just say Blight, for example. You just ignore the turrets. The I turrets. don't remember last time I actually used a turret and yeah. I had use of it. So, But, you know, again, that's 1% aspirational game chasers. We'll get to the point where we're going to be very geared. And yeah. at that point, we might just rush to the totem kill and we're done. I'm not sure how they can prevent that. So, yeah, I think it could be a fun mechanic either way. But definitely that will very mm -hmm. likely turn into the gameplay with that type of mechanic. From yeah. my perspective, I share the same concern, but that's like yeah. that's honestly my only concern. It looks yeah. fun outside of that. Rest is good, right? Yeah, uh, theoretically, yeah. Yeah. it's got a good unique reward as well. The tattoos, they're gonna be really, really good. Obviously, that's gonna be fun. Yeah. Do you have a similar opinion? Um. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna boil down to whether or not you have to use the units or not. Most yeah. likely not in the end game. <laughs> it is. Uh, and it's got a unique reward, so it will be worth doing. Those tattoos will be used in they're some form of build. Easy. Yep, there you go. So, I mean, it's already worth doing. You can fully trade it with the silver coins. So even if you don't like it, you're going to get currency from it, which is good. So, mm. yeah, I mean, it's win, 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 win. There's not really any downside. I agree. Yeah, completely agree. Balance. That's good. All right. Thank you, Snap and Grim, for coming. No um, had a good talk. No uh, guys, this is a very short stream, so uh, I haven't we haven't really been able to read the chat because it's a very scuffed setup. I hope the, uh, the sound was fine. Glad you guys tuned in. Um, I'll probably have my editor smack it up on YouTube or something. Yeah. Um, we are going to get ready for dinner, and uh, you are flying back tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes. And when are you flying back? Wednesday. Wednesday? I'm assuming you guys are planning on doing some content when you guys get home at, um, uh, or something. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Got a few things to talk about. <laughs> Just... Yeah, so mostly YouTube because you said that before, yeah, but you guys can find yeah. Grimroll PUE on YouTube. That's um, me. Snap O W. Uh, yeah, and the same thing on YouTube, right? Yeah. yeah. O W. Snap. And uh, well, you know where you found us here, <laughs> guys. Thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you guys uh, later or on YouTube or when we're back home, I guess. So uh, till then. Be with you, Pog. <laughs>